Uh, do we have Spanish translation? We do. We have Esperanza Viegas with us tonight. Esperanza, would you please introduce yourself? Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Esperanza Villegas y esta noche estoy aquí para traducir. Si alguno de ustedes tiene preguntas, me puede encontrar en la parte trasera de esta sala. Gracias. Thank you. As noted on the screen here, there is uh, hearing assistance available. Uh, closed session, there is no announcement of closed session action items. Um, acceptance of donations. Move Can to approve with appreciation. This list. Second. Uh, Mrs. Carter. <laughs> right. Harder. Uh, Parker, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, any opposed? No. Nope. Hearing none, passes 5 0. Introductions, proclamations, presentations, or recognitions? Well, we do have a presentation tonight. Our students and staff are extremely supportive members of the community and regularly fundraise for causes that are close to their heart. Whether it is to help tsunami victims halfway around the world or raise money for food and holiday gifts for children in the community, you can count on our students. And while Mr. DeVries is coming up, let me just tell you that the San Marcos High School students took fundraising to a new level when Jamie DeVries and the students in his economics class at San Marcos used business skills to make a difference in the lives of children. Jamie is here to tell us about Kids Helping Kids, an incredible project. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarvis. Yeah, I'm pretty proud of uh, my students. Those uh, three students back there are an indication of uh, a much wider effort, but they were amazing at uh, their efforts in coordinating all of our activities. What this started a couple years ago as a way to just give back to the community. And I teach economics classes, and I thought, uh, what better way to try to implement some of the lessons we learn in textbooks and apply that to actually uh, looking outside of our own self-interest and giving back. And I found the, uh, the Unity Shop as a, as a great avenue for that. And so when the Unity Shop, um, we have a, our annual penny drive, I thought we can do a little bit more. And so I went to the students and asked them if they're up for a challenge. And they said yes. And it's been growing ever since. And I don't know if you're familiar with the overall premise, but essentially the kids go out and solicit donations. And then on, in one night in December, uh, we all uh, uh, have a big fundraiser night and they go ahead and sell those items and raise money. And this past year, uh, these students raised almost $118,000 for the Unity Shop, which is pretty, pretty incredible. But in the, in the meantime, one of the things I'm most proud of is that, yes, they learned about average variable costs and average total costs and nonprofits and economic profits and all those things, supply and demand curves that we can actually apply to real life. Because as you remember, in your econ textbooks, not everything is the most uh, entertaining. So when they were actually doing this in real life, it was, it was a lot of fun for me to see. So when they, when they went out and, and, uh, and did this, uh, they weren't going downtown just to look for uh, holiday gifts for themselves or something to ask their parents. They're actually going to businesses and asking what they can contribute to help out uh, other uh, kids in our, community, in our community that need uh, a little hand up. So that was, that was a great joy for me to see. And uh, consequently, you know, and I'll have to say, uh, our block schedule that we have at San Marcos really allowed us to do this because I can do all the AP Econ, and outside, uh, we can uh, start working on our Kids Helping Kids program. So we, we're hoping that, my goal is that when these kids go off into their college and universities, that they'll take that same uh, model and apply it to their own communities throughout the country. And, and I hope other econ teachers can do this, because it really works. Um, last year, we had uh, three sections of kids taking AP exams, and over 90% pass rate, you know, 40% higher than the national average. And this year, our goal is a triple 100, which is a 100% pass rate in micro and macro, and then over $100,000 raised. So the, we're one third of the way there. And uh, judging by their finals that they just took, they're, they're ready for the, the exams in May. Um, so I'm really proud. So I appreciate you taking this time to recognize them, because really, I'm just the guy on the side who is able to watch what they're doing and with extreme pride and uh, joy. Thank you. Well, Mr. DeVries, uh, let's have your students stand so Abs we can recognize them. Maybe you can tell us who they are. 
Oh. And, you know, every time I see Tom Reed in the Unity Shop, of course, they are overjoyed as well. Yeah, the ac absolutely. These are the real heroes behind it all. I can't tell you how many nights that I would drive by San Marcos and see my classroom light on. You know, it could be a Friday or Saturday night where other kids might be doing some things that sometimes parents aren't proud of. They're over in, in my classroom putting items of gifts inside baskets and wrapping them. And we had hundreds and hundreds of items that would flood in, and they're the ones who made it all happen. So from left to right, it's uh, Megan Lorenzen and Nina Topinko and Sharzi M. <laughs> all right. You don't pronounce it correctly because I always get it incorrect. <laughs> Your last name, Charles? Macaramey, yeah. <laughs> and, and we're just, uh, they're three stars, and I wanted them to be recognized because, honestly, it was just me just seeing what they would do. It's all student-run, and they, they take the, the goal, and they just go with it. So I'm really happy about that. Thank you, and thank you for coming here today. And we are... <laughs> We are very proud of you all to do to do that. That is just wonderful. Anyone else? I just have one complaint before <laughs> Mr. DeVries leaves the room. We had to choose between coming to a board meeting <laughs> or going to the fundraiser. Oh, you chose wisely. <laughs> <laughs> was it Tuesday? Excellent. Okay. <laughs> uh. Well, that's it for tonight's presentations. Uh, superintendent report. Good. Well, today is the beginning of a new semester for our junior high students and our high school students. We're also in the middle of the open enrollment period. Our kindergarten student early enrollment ends March 1st. The early open enrollment for the elementary district ends again at the end of February, March 1st, and early open enrollment for the secondary district ends March 1st. Open houses are scheduled at each campus. So this is the time for parents to get their kids enrolled in kindergarten or state their preference about students attending other schools that are not their own home neighborhood school. Flyers are in the back of the room for each of these. My office regularly issues a report to the board called the Board Brief. This is a collection of reports and articles on district and school matters. A copy is on display in the reception room or can be provided through my office. The January 11 board brief was packed with items and information and I will highlight only one of them on dropout rates. While it is difficult to calculate, our best estimate of the district's dropout rate is that 5% of our students starting grade nine do not make it through the 12th grade. Our rate of 5% is better than the county rate of 8% and much better than the state dropout rate of 15%, but it is disproportionately high for Latino students. The dropout rate for Latino students is three times higher than it is for white students. We also wanted you to know that we've added a new section to the district's website, Book Corner, written by elementary district librarian Nancy Tobin. The first entry is on instilling the joy of reading. We will be adding to the section and translating the entries into Spanish. Coming up, our districts are joint sponsors with the League of Women Voters on the February 20 noon forum on closing the achievement gap. We'll get you more information on that as we get closer to it. And coming up in the days ahead at our schools, at Goleta Valley Junior High School, and board members have a copy of this flyer, we will hold astronomy night between showers period time of the year. And of course we want all the showers, but not during the, the stargazing. This whole family event is, uh, is scheduled so that the family is invited to peer through high powered telescopes to, veer, to view the wonders of our universe. A 7 p.m. slideshow will be, will inform viewers about globular cluster, globular clusters, <laughs> globular clusters. <laughs> Sounds like a C's candy, doesn't it? Uh, nebula, stars, and planets. And at San Marcos High, we will have Cabernet, uh, Cabaret Night. <laughs> Cabaret. <laughs> Which <laughs> sounds like a drink. <laughs> 
Now, it's cabaret night. <laughs> we don't serve cabernet at San Marcos High School. It will also take place Thursday in the auditorium at 7 p.m. Students will perform Broadway show tunes, classical areas, and original contemporary compositions. Tickets are $10 for the concert plus dessert. And I am saddened to report on the death of a La Colina Junior High School student. Hunter Goff, a 12-year-old, a seventh grader, was diagnosed with leukemia in early December and passed away on Saturday. Counselors and school psychologists were available today to support students and staff. Hunter's service will be this Friday and the school's leadership class is planning a celebration of his life at the school. Our condolences have gone out to the family. And I've reported on this before, but I want to let you know again that the memorial service for La Colina Junior High School's first principal, Jack Richards, will be held at the school this Sunday at 1 p.m. He was the school's first principal and the father of the late J.R. Richards, Santa Barbara High School's principal. And that's it for the superintendent's report tonight. Thank you, Dr. Sarvis. I uh, don't see any public comments, uh, so we'll move on to the consent agenda. And we have 27 items, so um, do move I? Move to approve. I'd, I'd like to pull one, <laughs> which is D15. Is there anyone else? Well, I, I want to pull some, but only for the purpose of acknowledging two rather remarkable things. So we want well, just well, acknowledge, I, I want to the, <laughs> the twenty thousand dollars saving that Brian Tangway made. Mm -hmm. Item seventeen, so you don't need to pull it. <laughs> and I want to, and I want to acknowledge the the deal that David Hetnyunk cut, getting portables at a buck a piece. <laughs> yes. The only question I have is, why didn't you buy more? <laughs> I wish I cut the deal. <laughs> I wish I could take responsibility. Thank you. Okay. So okay. move to approve with the exception of item D15. I'll amend my motion. Second. I hear a motion and a second. Uh, Harder and Cordero. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Not hearing any. Aye. Uh, passes 5-0. So we can move on to our action agenda um, and come back to uh, the one consent agenda item later this evening. Um, the action agenda E1, adoption of resolution number 0708-17, recognizing the DP High School Engineering Academy. Move to it, uh, adopt. Second. Any discussion? No. Nope. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No, not hearing. Anything uh, passes 5-0. We can move on to D2. Uh, I'm sorry, E2, uh, E2, mm -hmm. E2. Uh, approval to apply for the school violence grant and direction for application elements. Well, as we discussed at our last meeting, which uh, was just a week ago and a continuation of our discussion on gang prevention and intervention, um, we have the opportunity to, to apply for a school violence grant and Michael Gonzalez, our Director of Compliance and Categorical Programs, has put some of the materials together for you to consider and will make the presentation and, and take direction from the board. Thank you very much. I'm going to, uh, with your permission, refer you to uh, the second page of attachment E2. At the uh, very top of uh, E2 are the recommendations by staff for how we go about applying for the grant. Uh, very uh, specifically, at, uh, at the top of page two, the first um, proposal we would like to fund is the gang intervention specialist that will assist schools with finding students with violent behavior, or potential for violent behavior, assess their needs, and identify the optimal available services to improve their behaviors. The second recommendation staff is making is that we seek funding to implement a parenting program to reduce parenting styles that put children at risk 
for increased aggression and delinquency. The third area is that we'll seek funds to incorporate a threat assessment on uh, assessment process for investigating, evaluating, and managing violence, including district-specific surveys to create more safe and secure school uh, environments in order to permit school and law enforcement officials to respond responsibly, prudently, and effectively to threats and other behaviors that raise concern about potential violence. Finally, we'll seek funds to purchase video technology to explore their effectiveness in augmenting our school's capacity to monitor and supervise students. I've also attached uh, uh, a copy of the gang intervention specialists. I, I've noted in uh, the attachment that the approximate cost for each position is approximately 64000 plus with salary and benefits. The total cost of the four positions would be approximately 259500 uh, to clarify the fiscal impact, that there were some questions from several audience members. Um, the, uh, the, the uh, program does permit the district to apply for, uh, we indicated at least two 500,000 grants over a five-year period, i.e. $100,000 per year. One grant would be specifically written for the high schools, another grant would be specifically written for the junior highs. Um, that's the recommendation staff is making. I, I also want to share with you that uh, we were asked to explore with uh, Mike Furlong what a district assessment might look like. I was told that uh, in the uh, California Healthy Kids Survey, they maintain what's called Module G, which is a local, uh, which is a module that can be modified, customized to meet the specific needs of a local district. In uh, conversations with uh, Dr. Furlong, he indicated that we would take um, uh, module G and uh, begin to make more precise questions. Uh, the recommendation of staff is that if we chose to do that, that it would not be part of the Healthy Kids Survey that's usually given in November and December, that we would make it apart from that survey to make that determination about weapons, guns specifically, being brought to our campus. Um, the, uh, I, I think I'll stop there and share with you that that's what uh, staff is recommending for uh, this grant. I share with you again that we do have a deadline of February 22nd if you would like us to proceed. Thank you. Can I just ask you a real quick question just to start? Um, the, on the first page, it says the four ca uh, categories um, of strategies for uh, this grant. Are they in any particular order? Or are those just uh, are those the order that they suggested it in, or the is that just any order? This is an order that their planning documents provided to us. Correct. Okay, thank you. Hey, but let me share with you that one of the main threats grant is the need for coordination. And, and they're essentially saying, just, just to follow up to your question, that all four areas need to be pursued, that uh, focusing on just one aspect of those uh, strategy areas will not bring about the desired uh, outcome. Just a quick clarification, Mr. Gonzalez. I'm not sure whether I misheard or whether you misspoke. Two $500,000 grants, one for junior high, one for high school, so potentially a total of a million dollars over five years. Correct. Thank you. A million dollars over five years or? Correct, a million dollars, so, so essentially it's a $100,000 per year per application and we're putting uh, the applications. Okay. But that would not cover the costs of just the gang intervention specialists that you have listed here. No, it would not. And, and okay, uh, the your question or the answer is: Please recall that we have made a commitment to CADA to, in some way, continue our partnership with them. In that, it's very clear that uh, 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 there is a very clear nexus, a connection between 
substance abuse and violence. And so we believe that that's a vital component that we uh, continue with. And so there's priorities for those monies very clearly. So the reality is that um, if we were able to get the grant that probably at best you might be able to conduct a pilot program with one school using um, some type of gang intervention specialist, uh, maybe in each district, I mean, sorry, at each grade level, junior high that, and high school. That, that could be a reality. Uh, uh, if, if only in the state, uh, our hope is that uh, we'll be able to attract other community benefactors in resource-rich Santa Barbara and not just talk about one pilot. Mm -hmm. Well, um, my, I, I personally think that it's a, a great idea for you to go forward with a grant. My issue with the gang intervention specialist part of it is that um, at our last meeting, we were told repeatedly that it's really not a gang violence issue as much as it is a youth violence issue. And so I'm a little concerned at the narrowness of the title for this position. And I think it might better serve us if it gets broadened a little bit to youth violence specialist or, or something like that. But my other, uh, the other thing that I feel like would really strengthen it is if we had input directly from principals. If they take a look at this uh, job description and can tell um, the board how would they really, you know, in the course of their day from 7.30 in the morning to 3.30 in the afternoon, how would that person's, what would their day actually look like? And do they have any ways that they would want to tweak it? But um, that would be my suggestion. We don't have the information, but I assure you we can change that title very easily. Ms. Cordero. I had a couple of just very quick questions as well. Or maybe they're quick, maybe they're not. Um, one is, I know that you have a, we have a very tight turnaround time on this um, plan, and I'm wondering if we approved this tonight, um, we, we, if we gave you the approval to proceed, will we see the actual plan or application before it goes forward? Um, I, I think we could. I mean, we're obligated to hand this document on February 22nd. We would expect that that document would be done in about three weeks. And so given whatever we are on the board calendar, I suspect we could bring that document um, as close as a draft of that document uh, to a uh, subsequent board meeting, yes. And I had a couple of questions regarding parental involvement and community involvement. Um, other than the CADA uh, relationship, where, how are we addressing th those two components? Um, I, I'm not sure I can give you, uh, uh, well, l let me share with you a couple of ways. First of all, the, the CADA component, the, the reason, and uh, I'll defer to our assistant superintendent, but. CADA presently has probably the largest parenting program available in the city. It currently does not meet our requirements for uh, gang youth violence, but we have been assured by their staff that with some modifications they can do it. One of their trainers uh, has a very fine reputation in the community, and we're pretty confident that they can accomplish what they say they can accomplish. Now, I want you to know that up till now, I've had no direct communication with CADA regarding this grant. I do know that our assistant superintendent has had some conversations, but in terms of actual writing the grant, we have not yet approached them pending your approval that we proceed. Um, the, the idea of community involvement um, is, a, is a larger issue. Um, we, uh, should you approve the intervention specialists, those folks are going to come from the community. For example, ha at the last board meeting, we had representatives here from all for one. Those are exactly the kinds of organizations we're going to go to uh, 
uh, to see if they're interested in sending their staff for these positions. Those are currently the folks that have the kind of, of experiences and expertise we believe is necessary uh, for our uh, 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 endeavors here, for our efforts here. The thing about uh, the, the to answer your question, to continue with your question, you've asked about the community involvement. Um, please know that we currently have two projects underway. One is an invitation to attend a City of Santa Barbara-led uh, meeting. It was by invitation only that's scheduled on January 31st from 11 to 1. That meeting is drawing from uh, all the resources in our community to put us over at Chase Palm Park and put our heads together about how do we put together a coordinated effort. Uh, simultaneously to that, there has been a group uh, that includes uh, Cam Sanchez, uh, Salud Carvajal, uh, the uh, leadership of La Casa de Raza, the leadership of uh, the Center for Chicano Studies at UCSB, and district personnel who have been meeting to put together a symposium that's scheduled sometime either late February or March to uh, give a Latino perspective on youth violence and gangs. Um, so the district has been involved in a number of different efforts that include the community. I, I wouldn't want you to think that we're doing this on our own. That particular group, the Latino uh, group, has uh, we've shared with them our proposals and we've not asked for endorsements yet, but it's pretty clear that uh, they endorse the movement, uh, or the direction we're headed to. Last point I want to make about that particular uh, effort, it's actually being funded by uh, Chancellor Young's um, monies out of the university. They believe that as an education institution here, they've got to play a more active role in this very high profile issue that we've got. And so the chance is currently providing the funding to pull this thing together. Well, thank you, I'm, I'm really glad to hear all of, I, I know that we are, that the district is involved in a lot of community um, meetings, task force, workshops, et cetera, around this issue. And so I'm hoping that when, when we do see a copy of the plan, uh, that it would have some specific organizations that we are planning to work with and that they have actually endorsed it or agreed to be part of this. As a matter of fact, I don't think that our application will be approved without that element. It's a vital component uh, in uh, endorsements of that kind. Great, thanks. Okay. And then just one more thing, and it's probably uh, something we can address very, very easily, and that is in the uh, job description for the gang prevention inter intervention specialist, um, I noticed that the, the focus of the position is supposed to be on prevention and intervention services to children and youth at risk of gang involvement, et cetera. But under the knowledge and abilities, specifically says, uh, among many other things, um, the uh, ability to establish and maintain effective working relationships with school personnel and administrators, commu community and agency representatives and I would really like to see youth included in whom this person should have effective relationships with. I, um, I, I agree with you. Y you know, it's, uh, job descriptions are uh, sometimes easy to leave off very fundamental issues. Um, l let me share with you one other aspect that you haven't asked, but, but I want to share this with you. Um, my couch, who you all know is, is one of the, uh, we continue to have an association with our ex-assistant superintendent. You know, uh, one of the persons who has endorsed this gang intervention specialist is my couch. And I will share with you that his comments to me have been the following. 
that when this idea was first surfaced, there was much opposition, not only in the district offices to that, but also at Santa Barbara High. Santa Barbara High staff was not in support of the gang intervention specialist. Mike will share with you that at the end of that experience, these folks, the staff of the school was sold. Y you have heard that, um, th that uh, the person that we had in that position may have radicalized youth as a way to get them uh, away from the gang influences. I will share with you that that history is a bit backwards. Uh, Ross Gastro uh, would make no bones about sharing with you that he was a militant here in Santa Barbara. In the late 60s and early 70s, he was the advisor to the Brown Berets. Uh, he would make no apology for his involvement for the Brown Berets. Part of the reservation from the district and Santa Barbara High to Ross was recognition that that's the kind of work he was involved in. When he got to Santa Barbara High, uh, almost 15, 20 years later, uh, it was a different Ross, a Ross that understood that militancy is not going to get what we need. What we'll get, what we need, is working with young people who identify with gang cultures, and that's what he did. And he did not steer them into militant action. What he did steer them into was a peaceful coexistence that for a time resulted, or no, I shouldn't say for a time. Pro-Youth pro Coalition continued that work and we've not had a death on our campuses since the days of Ross Gastro and the Pro-Youth Coalition. That was the consequence of their work. Well, I, I appreciate your saying that because Ross was a very good friend of mine and, and, and yours as well and a great elder, I think, in the Latino community. And yeah, I think we do his legacy a great disservice if we minimize it to just the, his political positions. Um, I think it's really interesting that the day, a day after our great observance of Dr. Martin Luther King's work in our society, we're, we're talking about another person. I mean, Dr. Martin Luther King could have also been identified as a radical or a militant um, for some of the things that he advocated and did, and yet his his effect on the youth of the time and even to this day is profound. And I think Ross certainly his legacy lives on. In, we saw Matt Sanchez, who was extremely well influenced by by uh, Ross Castro, and I think many, many, many of the youth and many of the adults who are now involved in trying to get the youth away from gang violence and other kinds of youth violence were heavily influenced by Ross Castro and other people of his uh, stature and generation. So I agree with you. Um, he, while he had th those politics, I mean, he, his influence went well beyond the, the venue of his politics. Sure. Thank you. Did you want to say something, Mr. Trumbull? Uh, I just wanted to, to make one additional comment. Um, Mr. Gonzalez was alluding to CADA, the Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse. It's, it's a good idea, I believe, for us to include them because they actually do a, a great thing for us. Title IV, Safe Schools Through No Child Left Behind is an unfunded mandate in so much as we are required to provide uh, education in junior high school and high school for drug-free and violence-free environments. CADA actually has been providing that, that instruction for us. They've been training the individuals, they've been hiring the individuals, and they've been uh, exceeding our internal capacity in that manner. And so because we have that mechanism in place, it would make this a portion of this particular grant more attractive. On the student level. Uh, just, uh, Uh, I had a particular question about that, but I want to address the more fundamental issue. Uh, I, uh, I downloaded the uh, request for applications and spent a few hours looking through it, uh, including the scoring rubric. And uh, uh, you can't go far in that without running into the, the requirement, the expectation uh, for what they call a broad co uh, co collaboration. Okay. Uh, and particularly 
uh, for the convening of a focus group, a broadly collaborative focus group, the assignment uh, of that group being to define the needs of the community with regard to uh, the prevention of uh, youth violence. And uh, when I read that, I couldn't help but get the feeling that, that, that the district is going at this in a rather opportunistic way, saying we know what we want to do, we know what our needs are, and we know how we're going to solve them. Let's look at this program as a way to find the bucks. And, and you know, of course, it's our right to apply on our own terms. It's equally their right to say that we are uh, uh, not uh, following the guidelines envisioned by their program. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned, and that's what I meant last week when I, when I made that statement, that that was a meeting, not a, not a process. It wasn't a collaboration. That just happened to be some people who, who came, and many of whom didn't know about it until I told them about it. Uh, and I, and I, I don't fault anyone for that. It's just that, that what, it, what was enlightening to me was how many people there are, uh, how many groups there are in the community, and not all of them were there, uh, who, rep who uh, represent resources in this area. I subsequently found, uh, looking through in the uh, list of, you'll recall uh, uh, on the RFA they have a reference, or maybe it's just on, on a website, uh, they have a link to the uh, research-based programs and then another link to the science-based programs, which is even better than a research-based program. And one of them was, help me with this acronym, something BB, three Bs. I, I don't big remember, brothers, but... Big sisters? Yes. Okay. He's and, and so I looked that up because that, here it is, science-based program. And, I thought, and, and they fortunately have a bunch of pointers. And so the Family Service Agency happens to be the, how, the, the, the local home for that, for that program. And I'm thinking, well, it'd be nice to hear, to hear what they could bring to the table. So what, what, I'm, what I'm concerned with is that, that we, have, we may be locking in too uh, prematurely on a solution uh, and bypassing the process that the that the uh, grant administrators envision as a means of defining the problem and searching for and defining the solutions. I mean, and I, that's that's one point I want to make that I'll, I'll stop there. For now. I would share with you that um, two points. One, staff has been able to take a look at this problem for well over a year and taken a look at a lot of research and talked with a lot of people and attended countless community meetings about this. I, I think uh, one of the observations I would like to make to you is that the, uh, the groups that have been working on here have developed some very firm proposals. You know that our after-school program has been greatly expanded thanks to the efforts of the city. You know that a jobs program was put together, again, thanks to the city as well as other groups. Outside of that, the conversations of our community have been very difficult in finding what works. In a, in a fair and equitable world, we would have the kind of time that is required to bring about the kind of consensus you seek. My experience over the last 35 years indicates to me that the CDE doesn't really work that way. They release an application and they tell you, you want it, get it in. And, and yes, they, they very clearly call for that collaborative effort, no doubt about it. And between now and February 22nd, we will have to host these meetings. And uh, I, I share with you that the longer we wait to approve this process, the more difficult it is for us to schedule that collaborative process. And, and that's really all I can share with you. Yeah, no, that uh, Mr. Gonzalez, I'm not saying delay anything. I'm, I, I, I say full speed ahead. I'm saying, though, that in good faith, when you go to people and say, we want you to participate in a collaborative process, to define the needs, in good faith, we shouldn't have a solution up our sleeve, that we should let them be part of the solution. I, I agree with you, Dr. Noel. However, I share with you that uh, there's a reason staff exist, that they do become uh, uh, experts in their field. 
uh, one a year and a half ago, I would not know uh, what I know about gangs. You have asked me to research. The superintendent has asked me to research. And I believe staff now has a body of expertise that uh, is not matched well in this community. And that's simply the only thing I can respond to your concern. Uh, but I do agree with you. But I wanted to defer first to Mrs. Parker. Well, I just wanted to ask you, because it's directly on this point right now, uh, your, your sort of uh, third part here is we will seek funds to incorporate a threat assessment process for investigating, evaluating, and managing violence, including district-specific surveys, et cetera. If, as part of that process, you were to find, for example, that um, there were science-based uh, research that showed that something else might be more effective than where you're currently spending your money, is there anything in the grant that would say you couldn't shift it based, uh, you, you couldn't shift how the money was spent slightly if this, this threat assessment process showed that it, it really would be more effectively spent in this other area? I've had an opportunity to work with a number of grants and almost all granting agencies uh, there is a process whereby you can petition to move in a different direction if the direction that you shared with in your initial application is counterproductive or is not resulting in the desired outcome. So yes, I, staff remains very open to, to what might work better. Can I get something in for, for just a second? Um, at, uh, when I was at San Marcos, I, um, I noticed they have, because of our grant last year for counselors, there was an extra counselor that was hired that deals with at-risk students. And granted, there is a difference between at-risk academic students and at-risk for school violence. But I was, I was impressed that at, at San Marcos they had positioned this person to be near the uh, place where the public could come in, that the idea was to increase the participation of their parents, to get their parents involved in these kids' education. And it seems to me that that, that dovetails very nicely with this, um, that that may be a position that could work with a, the, um, with the I mean, this is a, a counselor, a certificated person that could work with this gang special, uh, the specialist that we hire. Does that make sense? It, it makes very much sense. Please know that what you're referring to is a hired under the supplemental counseling program, they're required to do exactly what you're speaking to. And so, yes, this would be a logical marriage. I don't want anyone thinking that a gang intervention specialist or a youth violence intervention specialist alone will solve a problem. Uh, better be a coordinated approach using uh, not just the counselors, but the classroom teachers that, of course, have the greatest impact on our students on a daily basis. I, I don't want to make the motion to adopt, but if but I but I do want I would want to make it a motion to amend. And I just want to show you where I'm where I am on that issue. Uh, I think that whatever resources we garner in this area should be divide, divided approximately equally. There should be parity uh, among three functions, uh, one of which is intervention, uh, another one which another of which is prevention and the third one being security. And I, I find no reference in any of this material to security. And as you know, I'm concerned with immediacy, with what we call the most proximal variables in determining outcomes, uh, namely the questions of weapons uh, on campus. And, uh, and I would like to see as, as a, a matter of priority I'd like to add equal emphasis between these three areas, but within the security area, I have uh, four main points. Uh, one, a goal, the primary goal would be to interdict the movement of weapons and drugs onto campuses. Two, uh, uh, two to prevent criminals from having free access to campuses and to make campuses secure from criminal activity. Three, to upgrade all campus safety assistant positions to secure to school security officers and to provide training according to the Education Code Section 
38001.5b, and I do appreciate uh, uh, Dr. Robertson's memo to that point. But, um, and finally, to provide safe passage for students to and from school. And as I mentioned uh, at the last meeting, there is an off-the-shelf safe passage program. I shouldn't say off-the-shelf. There is assistance from the uh, Cal California Council on Community Relations uh, in, that will help uh, schools and communities organize uh, a safe passage program, which, they, which uh, has proven very effective in other areas. So th those would be my sense of priorities. And, I, and, and as I say, I, 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 I find that this proposal for this framework for submitting a proposal under the uh, uh, Community Violence Prevention Program is out of balance, that it needs a, an equal emphasis on the security dimension of the problem. I'll second. Is that a motion? I think that was intended to be framed as a motion, Dr. Noel, yeah? Yes, let's, let's frame that as a motion then. Thank you, Mrs. Ari. And I have it here if you need it. Thank you. Discussion? Yeah, I have some questions about what the upgrade would entail in terms of upgrading the positions. Basically taking a course that's off, that was, uh, it's interesting, uh, the course syllabus is specified by the I don't really know what POST stands for. Peace Officer Training, POS something training. It's, 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 it's the state agency in charge of training of all kinds of, of uh, peace officer training. And they, they offer courses and they have regional centers. I think there's one at the Ventura Sheriff's Office. Uh, but, they, but this is much more uh, relaxed than that in the sense that they say, here's the syllabus you can offer yourself. Uh, it's a 24-hour uh, training, uh, and it includes uh, familiarization with law, with with school law, with respect to this. Something that came up a moment ago, uh, with student behavior, and the whole list of, of the kinds of things you would expect for a school, as distinct from uh, training a policeman who's going to walk the beat in the community. So it's it's that kind of thing. Well, that that sounds really good. I mean, sounds appropriate, but um, as you've Dr. Noel, I, I would feel a little bit uncomfortable voting to approve something that I've never seen. Um, I would maybe want to see what the outline of that course is, what its focus is, um, and how that would if you know, how it sounds effective, but I'd, I'd actually want to see it to be able to make a judgment about whether I believe it would be effective. But also I was wondering in terms of upgrading the position, would I assume there would be a cost associated with that as well. Well, I, I can tell you, Mrs. Cordero, and I, and I do appreciate your comment, uh, that uh, in a recent visit I made to uh, uh, Sagerstrom High School in Santa Ana, uh, which is a very high-flying school for disadvantaged students, for English learners uh, at all, and say 81 percent uh, 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 Hispanic Latino enrollment. Uh, 50 or 60 percent free lunch. I'm sorry, um, what was the name of that high school? Sagerstrom, oh, okay. which is a big name I'm finding in Orange County. Yeah. Uh, Sagerstrom mm -hmm. uh, 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 Performing Arts Center, Sagerstrom Boulevard, okay. Uh, and and uh, they, I talked with, uh, with both a, a campus security officer who was at the front gate of the school and asked him about how, th how it worked. And he explained that he had that training and that, in fact, at, at, at his district, that was a prerequisite for applying for the job. He had to do that on his own. Uh, I, call, I also then called the, uh, the uh, officer in charge at the district, and he said, yes, that's, that's what, what we require. And uh, in addition, they have to do they have to know CPR and, and first aid. Uh, Mrs. Cordero, the, the, the title, Campus Security, it's a little ambiguous, uh, but the title campus security officer uh, re requires that training, and it's, a, and it's a standard course. I wish I had the website on the top of my head. I'd give it to you, but I don't, but I'll be happy to email it to you. Uh, and what I mean by upgrade is that, and, and I've said it in different language, I just learned how to couch it in the terms of the education code, uh, is to professionalize our campus safety assistance, to, to make more uniform training, 
uh, to give them, uh, I mean, every time they deal with a problem, they are also putting us uh, at, at risk in legal terms. And so it gives them that kind of training that would help protect the district at the same time. One would like to think that their training will help them function more effectively on the campus. Uh, at Santa Ana, I, I asked, well, what's your turnover? Uh, what, what's the average age? Because the guy I talked to was a, a, a man who looked like about 30. And, uh, and he, they said, well, in fact, we've got people who've been with us for 25 years. Uh, I said, well, what do you pay them to keep them that long? We, we, the range for that position right now is 20 to $23 an hour. And, and, and I, I was struck when I found that we pay our campus uh, safety assistance only $17 an hour. And I, start, I mean, I don't think you can expect to move towards professionalization very far at $17 an hour. I think you have to think about uh, something that would uh, uh, sustain uh, life a little more effectively than that. Yeah, no, I have no objection to trying to upgrade the campus safety positions, but once again, I think we're in the position of, of uh, you know, assuming we got the grant funding, of uh, setting directions at this point without hearing from community members. If you divide the money up in equal parts for prevention, intervention, and security, you may end up with uh, no ability to hire any kind of youth violence specialist. You may end up with no ability to provide any meaningful intervention. Um, and I have no idea how far it would go on security, um, which was uh, that kind of, of you know, physical security, uh, campus security interdiction was not necessarily the major focus from my perspective of a direction that I wanted to go in. Um, I don't know how far the money would go there, but I, my concern is is that if we make a, a decision now that we divide the money up in those three different sections equally, that we may be undercutting one direction or another. Um, I would much rather uh, make a more general or have a more general motion to move forward with the grant and move forward with the process, see some kind of final proposal before the deadline rather than locking ourselves in in this kind of configuration right here right now are you withdrawing your second no I'm, oh i'm merely okay. providing discussion yeah Ms. parker well can i ask dr Nowell if that's what you meant because i can see where you, it makes a lot of sense to have a balanced framework but in terms of saying we're going to divide the money uh in very concrete terms into three parts when some things are simply more expensive than others, I'm not sure if that is what you meant. Did you did you mean that we should decide now that the money should well, be divided? I, I, no, I didn't mean let's start counting the money, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I threw I used the word parity, uh, also, which is a little looser than equality. Uh, uh, but 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 I, I, that's really a response to what I feel is really an out of balance approach, to a framework for doing the proposal now, and and framework is a good good word for what I'm talking about. We were setting, setting a tone. Here, here is here is where we want to see this proposal go, uh, and uh, uh, the you know we're period. Here's where we want to see this proposal go. Here are the priorities within that. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, with all due respect, that it, Dr. Noel, it seems to contradict your con your earlier concern, which is that if we are inviting other organizations to be collaborating on this with us to go in with such a very prescribed set of parameters with which we want to work seems to be um, putting the cart before the horse a little bit. Uh, it sounds like we're asking them, it sounds like we would be in a sense asking them to, to simply agree to something that we have already established and that seems to be contradictory to, to what I thought was your intent earlier, and which I thought was a good intent, um, to ask these other organizations to be true partners with us and glean from them any additional ideas, any additional suggestions and recommendations that they might, from their experience and their expertise, be able to provide. Ms. Parker. Well, without, um, 
without delineating the, the how the money is not how the money is spent, but how the framework is set up, even would it make some sense to have Dr. Noel's points about um, could we use the grant to uh, fund changing the position for school campus safety assistance uh, to upgrade that? Can we just sort of include that in the list of things that? could possibly have money spent on it from the I grant. would say of possibilities, but not certainties. I, exactly. I guess I have, you used a word that really caught my attention and that was interdiction. And what do you mean by that? Because I see fences again, and then you talk about a school where you met a campus security officer that has a front gate. And that's going in a direction that I quite frankly well, it, am uh, leery of. Because I tell you, because I've, I, I've started to read some of the research that uh, Michael's been reading, uh, and maybe some of the he hasn't been reading, uh, uh, because there are mixed findings about fencing. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so I moved away from that. As you know, I, I used to think that was a, a, a good step. Well, no, it doesn't look like it. It looks like it's, it, 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 it's not clear. But, but the goal to interdict the flow of, of weapons, and that then leads to the, to, the, to the development of the proposal, specifics about how would they proceed to interdict weapons. That's the goal. And I, and I, I hope to, yeah, these, I call these primary goals. Uh, I, I want to I uh, 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 grant uh, uh, your point, Mrs. Cordero, about the, the kind of contradiction. And in fact, uh, I'm torn because I, if I thought there was going to be a process that looked at this de novo without, without having uh, the momentum behind it that staff has built up behind this particular proposal, I would say, great. I would withdraw this, but I sense a great deal of momentum uh, behind some very specific proposals. And, uh, and then, then I say, well, there must be on the table some alternative proposals to create a greater balance. And, and yes, uh, it, lead, it left me uh, in that position. Okay, uh, I'll call the question. We can vote on this. I also feel uncomfortable with this very delineated. I'd rather see a different kind of motion. But Although uh, I think there's some good suggestions in yes. here, which we might be able to roll it over. So I, I, go ahead. So let's, let's just vote on this, and I hope we'll have another. Okay, anyways, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? No. no. Uh, can we hear a different, would anyone like to make another motion? Well, I'd like to move approval for the application with the direction that the plan come back before the board um, and take into account some of the uh, suggestions, possibilities, et cetera, that have been identified tonight. Can you add, uh, I'll second, can you add coupled with feedback from uh, community organizations? Sure, absolutely. And also another clarification, you said plan. A draft plan? Well, I mean the, uh, I, I should say, I guess, the actual A application. Grant application. application. Okay. A draft application. Yes. Then I'll second. Would, oh, darn, before you Did second that. And, and I want to clarify, <laughs> Mr. Gonzalez, that that would be workable to have a draft application come back before us? I, I think so. Okay. I, I then would like to move amendment, uh, and that is that uh, substantial participation by teachers in every aspect of developing the proposal. <laughs> <laughs> by teachers and principals? Teachers and administrators? I'm, I'm yeah. concerned about teachers because some I talk to uh, share some of the sense of not feeling all that safe on campus. And that's what makes me think about them. Well, I think if we look at the language um, of the the application that it requires involvement of the school, well, I guess it says school environment improvement, parental involvement. Yeah, maybe maybe it doesn't specifically include teachers, but I would include all uh, school relevant school stakeholders and certainly teachers are a primary segment in that okay well, I guess and if you the and if you was in the, the form of an amendment oh which I'm sorry I formally moved oh okay. I'm sorry I missed it what oh, was okay. the uh, 
that, that teachers be consulted. Oh, the teacher. Te uh, no, that teachers be involved in every in every aspect of the preparation of the proposal. Would you agree to substantial involvement? Do you want to just fold that into your? Yeah, I. Th yeah, sorry, that's fine. thought that's, that's what I was saying. Yes. Okay. So it just got folded into the motion. Uh, let, then let us hear the motion <laughs> before I withdraw my motion. I'd like to hear the way. I'd like to hear the, the fold. I think Ms. Waski has that. <laughs> I'm hoping she does. <laughs> okay, I have moved to approve the writing of the grant with a draft application to come back to the board coupled with community involvement and substantial input by teachers. It's a little awkward. <laughs> substantial involvement by teachers. In each phase? Hmm? In, In each, each phase? phase yeah. Does that capture it? I think so. We went back and forth a lot, so. <laughs> okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Did There's you another option. I no, abstain. No, <laughs> so four approved uh, voted yes and one abstention, Dr. Noel. Okay, we can move on then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to E3, approval of junior high school partner collaborative program between the Santa Barbara School District and the City of Santa Barbara regarding the junior high school after school activities of the school year 0708. Well, as you know, we are involved in collaborative efforts with the city. We've been very pleased with the responsiveness on the part of the police department and with the responsiveness on the part of parks and recreation in our after school programs. And this presentation is an outgrowth of that collaboration. And it's really a function of what parks and recreation can bring to the table. And with that, Paul, would you please introduce this? Thank you, Dr. Sarvis. Um, a little more than, uh, or a little less than a year ago in March, after uh, the homicide on, on State Street, the city and a variety of community partners specifically got together to talk about how we can possibly prevent this uh, from or that particular incident from happening again. Um, since then, the city and Sarah Hanna is, is here now representing the city have done a great job of pulling together a variety of different aspects on um, youth programs, on how to uh, expand things. Uh, you heard Mr. Gonzalez talk a few minutes ago about uh, job opportunities. Um, Sarah can probably speak a little bit about that as well. She spent, I know, a lot of hours involved, uh, involved with that. Tonight, specifically, uh, we're here to talk about the after school partnership program, which is a little different than the after school sports program in and of itself. Um, Mrs. Harder, at last, the last meeting, had asked for something like this, and it was already on the agenda. We just moved it from consent to action, which is um, uh, actually just nicely coincidental. So without taking up too much time, I'd like to introduce Sarah Hanna, who will talk about the efforts that she's put into building the program and how the two uh, entities, the district and the city, are interfacing. I assume this is on. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me here, President and board members. Um, I am Sarah Hanna. I'm the Recreation Programs Manager, and I'm here tonight to talk to a, about a very interesting opportunity that I think was initially hatched when Jan Zettel was leaving his position and Paul was coming on. And we started talking about different ways that we could collaborate differently to bring more partners into our community and into our schools. Um, we both have learned over the last year and through our histories of working with these agencies that it's so important for us to support our students and to support our communities as a whole. And I, I am impressed with the amount of time and energy and effort the uh, Board of Education and the City of Santa Barbara are putting into supporting youth and supporting families and supporting our community. Um, we were put up with a challenge and now we're going to be meeting that charge and I, I want to thank you for that and I also want to 
say that the city of Santa Barbara is behind you and with you 100% of the way. And it's, you know, it's really so great to have such a great relationship that both of us can come together and do so n many numerous things for the community. So we looked at uh, what the Parks and Recreation Department could do and how we could make changes. And because we have so many co-sponsorship agreements and because in the past we have heard a number of times from nonprofit agencies and from youth serving agencies, we want to get on the campus. We need to access students m more readily. And because of those hearing that and listening and understanding, uh, a, a plan was hatched to bring partners together in a collaboration to use city services in an, in an aspect that we had before to bring co-sponsors onto campus. And so here I am today, about six months later, bringing um, the first group of partners forward for your approval. The department really believes that by adding additional enrichment and recreation opportunities in the junior high and in other aspects of our after school programs, we can do so many different things to assist youth in making the best decision in what may be the most vulnerable and risky hours of their day, those that are after school. So the department launched into a series of outreach programs to about 30 different youth serving agencies to discuss with them what types of programs they provide, what challenges they had to reaching students, and the opportunities that may be there in the future for them. We requested proposals for either one-time or ongoing services, um, and that they would happen after school. But one of the main things about the program that they were to offer had to be that they were self-sustaining, that they used their own resources, and that the programs were provided free to students. We find this to be very important, especially with the seventh and eighth grade level, uh, especially with the students that may not be reached and supported with different types of programming um, that don't have those opportunities to go to clubs and paid programming after school. So I'm here today with four different um, agencies, Surfrider Foundation, Youth Media Project, which is Shape of Voice, which you've probably heard of, the Police Activities League, and the Club West Track uh, organization. I, it was, and it has been, a little bit disappointing that we were not um, more strongly uh, responded to, but we're not going to take it lying down. <laughs> um, we are going to continue our outreach efforts and uh, hoping that this will launch the opportunity that other folks will see the successes and that we will, as time goes on, be able to build additional project uh, programs onto campus. It's almost in a way a little bit better to have a slow start at it so principals become used to it, so the teachers become um, understanding of it so that they can use it as a resource for pres uh, parents and students and, and, and other people in the community. So uh, I think one of the key parts is, is that the city of Santa Barbara is here to um, do the logistics of bringing the partners on. We have a long history of collaboration and co-sponsorships with programs. We have frequently used our uh, facilities, people bring their programs to our facilities, we offer the facility, they offer the program. So we've done this many times. Um, if we were to implement such a program, each of the youth serving agencies that wanted to participate would enter into co-sponsorship agreement. They would um, indem indemnify and provide insurance to both the city and the school district. They would provide criminal background checks for all of their subcontractors, contractors, and volunteers, which we hope to maintain as a small group. And, um, and then we would provide the district with a list of the cleared participants. And so Paul and I would work very closely into scheduling and working with the principals, but also bringing forward those groups that were going to participate. Uh, the district, in return, would provide a facility, either an outdoor or indoor space for the program to take place. And then the city would continue to do program marketing and registration as we do for other after school programs. So I'm here today to, uh, you know, it's a, hap it's a happy time because it's one more step in us working together. I do find it to be a uh, 
I've seen a real change in looking at the city council and in, in the board of education. I've seen a real change in the philosophy and um, I, I think it's the best way to go and to bring us forward together. So we, we request that you uh, approve the launch of this program. I will be definitely back to see you at um, joint use meetings to give you an update as to how it's going. But um, I really appreciate the opportunity and would be happy to answer any questions that you may have about this or other city collaborative programs with the district. I think this is a very exciting start. Um, I, I just have one question. The last page here has a list of, uh, I don't know, 50 organizations. Are they some of the ones that you're going to go to yes, perhaps the, next? Yes. The, the list shows on the left-hand side our current co-sponsors who are using our facilities now and who provide programs with us. Mm -hmm. And the partners on the right were all invited. Um, some of the partners, because of the timing, it wasn't in this year's budget for them, or they wanted to go out and seek additional grant funding to bring a program to the schools. So we will be coming back to the partners to encourage them to participate. So when new partners come on, do will we hear will we yes. be hearing about it on our consent agenda? Yes. That's what I heard. Exactly right. And so what we're what we're looking at right now is the approval of what you see these four partners to start. for this particular semester second semester and then as the year goes on perhaps even as the semester goes on if there's any any new entity it would come back as a consent under the same framework great any yes yeah uh thanks miss uh hannah i was about to say clayton sorry <laughs> um it's a nice group of organizations uh, in, in terms of the kinds of activities that they'll be providing. Um, and I always like seeing uh, activities that aren't focused solely on athletics because up until now that's been a lot of the mainstay of our after school programs and it doesn't appeal to a lot of students. Um, so I compliment you on that and it would be really nice to see more arts and music oriented uh, opportunities uh, in addition to the others that you've brought forward and also in addition to the many athletic opportunities that are available. But I have a question for staff and that is how will students be notified of these opportunities? Will we be sending out a flyer? Will the city be putting together a flyer in collaboration with us? Or will the organizations be sending out a flyer and if the organizations send out a flyer as sponsors of someone who we have a joint agreement with, will it be vetted to focus solely on the activities that they'll be providing the students so that their, the students and their families aren't getting flyers about their fundraising activities, their mission, their et cetera, et cetera, and other activities that they engage in. We have already covered that one, and yes is the answer. The, the, I'll just leave it at that, shall I? <laughs> the, the, like that, yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the City of Santa Barbara will be sending out the flyers. We have an agreement already that's, that's um, in compliance with the school district's flyer policy. They'll be vetting out all the information and it will be a, a very streamlined process. So yeah, we've actually, that's one of the things that Sarah and I spoke back and forth about before this was submitted. Ms. Cordero. Um, just, I think that the, the group of uh, or the list of partners that you have here are wonderful. I mean, they certainly cover a broad spectrum of possible activities. And as you said, you may even be soliciting more. I would love to see something. Um, we have so many dance groups in Santa Barbara or dance uh, studios in Santa Barbara that specifically uh, focus on uh, flamenco or Spanish classical or folklorico um, that I would love to see if we could offer something like that after school as well um, but these are these are great the one correction I would make and I think unfortunately we made this correction the last time too is la casa de la raza is misspelled raza oh. should be spelled with a z it is <laughs> but, but um I, I I appreciate the I know that <laughs> the organizations that you have here. Good. So do we need a motion? I will move to approve. Second. Cordero and Harder. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Thank Five you. zero. Thank you so much. Uh, e four. 
Second reading and adoption revisions to administrative regulation, uh, uniform complaint procedures, um, and so forth. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Mr. Gonzalez will give this presentation. We've discussed this revision to the board policy on a couple of occasions, and I think we're ready to go with it. Anybody? Oh. I, I simply want to comment that, that the revision that was suggested about the language specific to the restroom was included in the complaint form, and... Um, other than that, we're ready to go. No, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Carter and Parker. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. E5. Uh, selection of independent auditors for fiscal year 08 09 with an option to extend through fiscal year 10 11. We've, ha we've had previous discussion about change in auditors. Um, when Eric Smith came on board, he said, I see that you're planning to change auditors in the future. May I run ahead with that? And I think it was his first day on the job that he put an RFP together and, <laughs> and uh, hear the results of that. So Eric Smith, our interim superintendent for business services. I think it actually took me more than one day, but I think it was one of the first <laughs> uh, tasks I engaged quick. in. So um, as the item lays out, um, the districts are contractually obligated to stay with Vavernick Tri Day and Company one more year. However, I was charged with putting together a request for proposals to circulate among qualified independent auditors to hopefully engage them so the districts could proceed with the new auditor starting in fiscal year 08 09 with the option of extending for two additional years. As you can see from the agenda item, we identified several auditing firms through the California Association of School Business Officials website. Um, we circulated the RFP. Um, we had five that did not respond. We had three that did respond. We had two that, um, or we had one that wanted us to waive the insurance requirements. And then we had uh, three that actually submitted proposals. So based on the proposals that were submitted, we looked at both the fiscal impact on a one-year and on a multi-year basis, and you see that in the chart that's uh, delineated. And you can see that the low is Nigro, Nigro, and white. However, since this is a professional service, you're not obligated to take the lowest, but looking at the proposal in conjunction with the price and given the fact that I know Christy White, she's a qualified CPA and she has done some work for the district along with FICMAT um, as an independent consultant, I felt highly comfortable in recommending Nigro, Nigro and White to be the district's independent auditor. I also, for posterity's sake, um, included the Ed Code provision that talks about changing the senior partner in an auditing firm every six years and you actually are running up against that constraint. So I think now is an appropriate time to engage a new independent auditor starting with the 0809 fiscal year. Um, there was a little confusion in the header in Nigro Nigro White's proposal where it said 0708 where it should have said 0809 and I clarified that that was just a typo and their price is held. So at this point, we're recommending that the board engage Nigro, Nigro, and White starting with 0809, and then you have the latitude, if you like them, to extend it for 910 and 10 and 11. Uh, how does the price compare to what we were paying before? For 0708, you're paying, or actually for 0607, you're paying $75,000. Okay. So a lot less money. <laughs> actually, I, I don't have any questions. I'll throw out a motion uh, to... Um, to approve independent auditors, <coughs> independent <coughs> auditors for fiscal year 0809 uh, with Niagara and Niagara and White uh, with an option to extend. Second. Uh, Harder and Cordero. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 5 0. Uh, we're up to E6, adoption of resolution 0708-15, delegation of governing board powers and du or duties. Well, this is a holdover item from our last meeting. Uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, Eric Smith was here before we took it up. 
Uh, I had contacted the county office and, and I learned that yes, this is the form that has been used for 30 years and yes, it's a form that's signed by all the other districts in the county. I know that, uh, Bob, you had a couple of concerns. Oh, I just don't want to blow up again here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, uh, with, all, with all due respect to all the other districts in the county and all, with all due respect to 30 years of, of, of history, <laughs> I had some concerns. Uh, the main one has to do with the single district resolution and education code provision 35111D. Mm -hmm. Now this, um, this says 35110 and 35113, well, that's which in includes 30. That's inclusive, that's yes. Yeah, I understand that. But 35, but all of, but this is all about what is authorized and 35111 one D is, is sort of imposes some constraints on the transfer of funds, and I and I would like to see some kind of a specific reference to that, so that it's very clear that th this can't be read as a as an authorization of transfers between the high school and the uh, elementary district without following the procedure set forth in 3511D. I have it here. I just had a thought, but by taking the initial action to adopt that resolution, didn't you in fact do that when you actually adopted the combined resolution? Yeah, every year we do this delegation of authority, and and, uh, and uh, I just think it's very because the constituencies are so different from the elementary and the high school district. I think it's very very important for us to make it very clear. And that's the interfund transfers between the special reserves from one to the other, correct? So the, the language here says from it, one fund to another in the district. It wouldn't prevent the transfers. It would require notification correct. in advance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, the, and that's yeah. the way it has to be, but you think it just needs to be explicit. I, 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 would, I would think it's important to be explicit about it because that's a very sensitive issue for a lot of people in this community. Since this isn't something that we can actually word, I, I would prefer that the um, perhaps our attorney would do this wordsmithing for us. Does that make Fine. sense? Can we, we do that and then put it on the consent agenda, agenda the next time? Yeah, we could certainly do that. Okay. Okay. I had a, I had a second concern, oh. uh, uh, and that that has to do with our recent history. And I, was ex I was explaining this to Dr. Sarvis uh, just before the meeting. Uh, on June 29th, we met uh, and uh, were presented with. Uh, we had been presented a couple days before with the so-called estimated actuals uh, report and with the projected budget, with the budget document to approve. Uh, and uh, it had a, you know, a bottom line, here's how much our ending balance was uh, on the estimated actuals, the opening balance on the, on the budget, uh, and here are the reserves. And then uh, at least a month later, we got a, a memo uh, you got the memo and, and then gave it to us from uh, Jim Balsano, uh, a consultant, telling us that that we had to transfer one million one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars into several funds: uh, self-insurance funds, uh, workers' comp fund, uh, uh, employee benefits, post-retirement benefits con funds, and I think uh, the, the, under the self-insurance fund, seventy-one is that what it is, Eric? 67. 67. There are a couple of yeah, other names sub that, funds. that are unique to this district, some numbers. 68. Yeah, I, there's some other 60 68 and 69 that yeah. roll into that roll up into 67. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, that so here was here a month after we had we thought we were in this financial position, we find out that in fact we're in a million 150 uh, worse financial position. And I'm not sure how, what what difference that would have made at the end of the year, uh, but it but I think it, it would be very helpful to know that. Uh, and, and it's even more confused because then when you go to reconstruct it, what went on uh, when, the, when those transfers are made weeks or months after the end of the fiscal year, they're post dated back to the June 30th, end of the fiscal year. I learned that and I'm, and I'm told that's standard practice and, that's correct. and no one questions it and I have no problem with that. But what I, what I think it would be very helpful to, for, for us to know uh, and, and, I, and I know that Mrs. Corpus is not going to let this happen again anyway, but, but just as a matter of, of procedure, uh, it would be nice to have a report at the time of the estimated actuals 
uh, saying explicitly, here's where we stand on these funds. Uh, we're okay, we have no negative fund balance, or we have some, we're gonna have to make a transfer. So we get a good sense of, of, of what lies ahead in that closing process. I, I believe I understand what you're asking for, but I don't think that the designation of signatories is the vehicle for handling that concern. I, I, would, I would agree with that, but it's the yes. vehicle that prompted me to think about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think two things. One, the estimated actuals are simply that, estimates, at the time that the budget's adopted. Relative to when, let's say there was an emergency, emergency situation where an interfund transfer had to be made to meet your 3%, and let's say you had to pull that money out of a special reserve for non capital outlay or some fund that was liquid, you, you would not be presented with that until the unaudited actuals and Which basically. Is like weeks and weeks, right? Yeah, usually you're not going to see, we have a statutory deadline to meet, you know, to present it to the board by. September 15th. However, because you're in closing as fast and furious to convene the board to get specific authority to do an interfund transfer is really shackling the hands of staff. I think what would be better suited is if they're kind of what we did with the first narrative with the first interim narrative is start identifying variances at the unaudited actuals or significant events that occurred so I think what you want is a public record, an audit trail of what occurred, and I think that's easier to do because what we're talking about usually are large amounts and you know they're identifiable and things of that nature. So I would like to try and preserve flexibility relative to staff's ability to meet their deadlines at year-end closing, but at the same time provide a formal record that's fiscally transparent for both the board and the public. But, I mean, but if you're saying just in retrospect, I'm, I'm, I mean something a little, that's great, but I mean something a little different. It's just, I'm going back to sitting there here on June 29th thinking that we were $1,150,000 better off than in fact we were, and, and, and if you tell me we couldn't have known that at that time, I, grant, uh, I understand. I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that comes down to how precise your you know, budget monitoring practice is during the course of the year, and then really looking at your variance between your actual expenditures and budget at year end or income and budget at year end and looking at a variance report. And we started to do that, I think, as you recall at first interim, saying, hey, here's significant variances from budget adoption to first interim. We had to adjust this up by X. We had to adjust this down by XX. I think one of the issues with respect to the estimated actuals is that if you look at your estimated actuals versus um, where you came in on the unrestricted side, and it's one of the first things I, s I did, was that on the unrestricted side, the variance was fairly marginal. Where the failure was, was in your budget in 07, 08, you had significant deficiencies in terms of revenues being you know, overstated or significant expenditures being understated. So that's where the breakdown in my mind is. Could, was could during we the leave this to Mr. Smith and Dr. Sarvis to put a future agenda item on because we're way beyond what we are agendized thing. for right now. Yeah. Say the same thing. I, I agree with that, okay. and and, uh, and I don't even I don't even know that it's necessary to bring it back as a, an agenda item, Mr. Narger. I, I just I trust uh, Mr. Smith and Dr. Sarvis that we can get some procedures in, so we don't get the surprise. It, it sure. Was just, it was a shock to read in, in August that yeah. we were a million one hundred fifty thousand dollars. I know. I read about it up in San Luis Obispo County. <laughs> you read about us? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, I, I, you know, every day I Google all California school districts and I look at what's going on. Wow. <laughs> well, we're going to put this on okay. maybe next week. We have a meeting next week, so we can do that. No, you don't need to bring it back to the. Well, well the, we do, we the, do uh, need the this the resolution to come back. Oh, the resolution. With the yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. with the, yeah, with yeah. the uh, correction sure. with. Uh, Mr. Price's suggestion. So I am going to uh, have a break now. We get to have a break for uh, 15 minutes. We're back. Uh, we're up to E7, approval of provisional internship permit. Well, we have Ann Peek with us tonight. <laughs> She's been anxious to talk to you. Um, <laughs> this item and the next item are both required to have action in public rather than be on the consent agenda. Ann Peek. Thank you. 
Um, as you are probably aware, because I bring these to you once every few months, uh, the Commission on Teacher Credentialing has eliminated the use of all emergency credentials. One of the credentials that bridges this gap is called a provisional internship permit. It is a requirement of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing that these be approved as an action item in order for the Commission to issue the credential. As you're aware, we have had trouble hiring fully credentialed special education teachers this year and have had mid-year turnover. At Lacumbra Junior High, we've had turnover in the area of special education and had a teacher resign right before the Christmas break. We offered a candidate the position and they declined. Carrie Minadio, a long-term substitute teacher in our district, as well as a previous special education instructional assistant, is pursuing his teaching credential, and we are asking for a provisional internship permit for him to cover him through the end of the 0708 school year. Um, we would be asking, is that it? Just for approval. Move to approve. Second. Harder and Parker. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. 5-0. Thank you. Uh, we're on to E8, approval of the variable term waiver. <laughs> Same introduction. Ann Peek, our <laughs> personnel analyst. Uh, once again, as you're aware, one of the options that's being offered by the Commission on Teacher Credentialing for credentialing teachers is what's called a variable term waiver. These types of credentials can cover statewide shortage areas such as math or physics, as well as other areas such as foreign language. They're typically used when no other type of credential can be issued by the CTC. It's a requirement of the CTC that certain credentials be approved as action items in order for them to be issued. Once again, as you know, this school year has been unusual in the area of staffing. One of our Spanish ELD teachers has taken a mid-year leave due to the fact that her husband was transferred to San Diego. We advertised and found a very limited pool of applications. Interviews were conducted and Simone Bollinger was selected as the teacher. Because she has not taken the CBEST exam, she is only eligible for a variable term waiver. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and a minor in Spanish. She has taught as an ESL teacher in Guam and Mexico and has been a Spanish and English teacher at the Berlitz Language School. She also has a TEFL certificate, which is Teachers of English, no wait. As a foreign, As foreign, a foreign language. language. Mm -hmm. um, from the International Teacher Training Center in, Mexi in Mexico and is currently pursuing credential programs that she can enroll in. Move to approve. Second. Harder and Parker, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Passes 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. We're up to board action on student expulsion cases. We're going to take uh, under E9 is number 0708-12 based upon the supplemental hearing in closed session. Uh, move to uh, uphold the findings and recommendations of the hearing panel. Second. Okay, wait a second. Sorry. Um, we're doing. This is 070812, right? Yes. 12. 1 2. Yes. Harder and, Harder and Parker. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Passes 5 0. Now we move on to E10, uh, Board Action on Student Expulsion Cases. We'll, uh, we'll take them in the order that's on here. So the first in one is. In case of 0607 0 90, yeah. First one. Mm -hmm. uh, move to uphold the stipulated agreement. Second. Second. Harder and Cordero. No, actually, it was Noel. Noel. Oh, sorry. I'm not. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 5 0. Uh, in the case of 0708 24, uh, move to uphold the findings and recommendations of the hearing panel to suspend the expulsion and return the student to their home high school. Is that the essence of it, Mr. Gonzalez? Yes. Okay. Second. Harder and Cordero, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. So four, one with Noel saying no. Okay. Uh, in the case of 0708-31, uh, move to uphold the findings and recommendations of the hearing panel. Can we um, 
indicate that the date on that is incorrect January that it should be January 2009 yeah okay. second Harder and Cordero all those in favor aye aye, aye. any opposed no passes 5-0 uh, in the case 0708-37, uh, move to uphold the findings and recommendations of the hearing panel. Second. Harder and Cordero, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Nope. Passes 5-0. Thank you. Uh, we're on to F1, report on the governor's 0809 fiscal year budget. Well, we asked Eric to spend time last week to make sure he knew all about the governor's dire budget proposal, and he's here to tell you about it. Thank you, Brian. As uh, Dr. Sarvis alluded to, I went to a conference on the uh, governor's budget presented by School Services of California, and I'm prepared to give a report on that. However, I think we need to start with what does the governor's budget mean to us? Well, the governor's budget is the first milestone in the development of our budget and establishes the assumptions, primarily on the revenue side, that will be used during the budget development process. And it's important to note that these assumptions will change due to both the legislative process and due to updated economic information, first at the May revise, and then generally at the time that the actual state budget is signed. As you all know, the state's deficit has really ballooned from an estimated $10 billion to $14.5 billion. The governor proposes both mid-year reductions and significant cuts in fiscal year 08-09 as a result, the governor's declared a fiscal emergency pursuant to Proposition 58 and has now called the legislature into a special session to deal with the budget crisis. The governor must submit a plan under Prop 58 to address the budget imbalance. The legislature must adopt a plan to address the problem by March 15th, otherwise it may not act on any other legislation and it may not adjourn. And the plan must be adopted by a two-thirds vote of the legislature <laughs> with the idea that the savings would actually accrue immediately. <laughs> First off, the governor tries to reduce the size of the 0809 budget by making reductions in the current year. There's a number of strategies he wishes to employ. The first one is reduce the current state's reserve level from 4.1 billion to 872 million, which in our nomenclature is called deficit spending. <laughs> Draw down 3.3 billion in economic recovery bonds, which we're not allowed to do that either, which is basically to issue debt to basically fund <laughs> operational cost. Reduce proposition in the current year uh, Proposition 98 by in the current year by 400 million and reduce other state programs including health care, prisons, state parks to make up the bulk of the difference. His approach to 0809 is even more draconian, a 10% across the board cut in all areas of government, a suspension of Proposition 98 resulting in a four plus billion cut to education, and he better pray for some good news because this looks pretty bad. Um, as far as mid-year cuts to K-12 education, the governor proposes $360 million in unspecified reductions to categorical programs in 0708. This represents an overall reduction of 2.5% to the 0708 Budget Act uh, as far as the levels of funding are for categorical programs. And it's unlikely that the cuts will be across the board, rather they'll be targeted. And one of the things we're hearing is that they're going to first look at unallocated categoricals or categoricals that were Prop 98 reversion where they weren't used and they were actually returned to the state. Um, the rest of the cuts will be made in the P2 apportionment. And what I mean by that is there's an estimate that we'll see a 0.5% deficit to the current year revenue limit, roughly $60 per ADA, which translates to about $821,000 to us. More cuts in 0809. Governor proposes cutting $4 billion by suspending Prop 98. Um, Prop 98's only been suspended one other time in 0405. 
which incidentally was under Governor Schwarzenegger's watch. The suspension requires a two-thirds vote by both houses of the legislature. I know there's a lot of people that are uh, very circumspect about whether there's the votes to get that done. But because we have to contemplate what these cuts mean and because they're going to be identified on the SSC dartboard, which is our industry standard in terms of uh, adhering to assumptions, we need to look at what that means. The first thing we know is this is going to be a 4.94% a 4.94% cola um, and then what's going to happen is the programs including the revenue limit will be adjusted for enrollment changes which is actually to the state's benefit since there's declining enrollment on a statewide basis. Then there's going to be a 10.9% across the board cut on the inflated state age share of funding. So the year over year net result is a 2.4% cut in revenue limit funding. And the reason that's different than categoricals is because remember revenue limit is made up of both of a combination of state aid and property taxes. So the 10.9%, the proportional share that's property taxes doesn't get hit with the cut. And then there's a 6.5% cut for most categorical programs. The governor proposes to allocate the 4.94% estimated COLA but then cut revenue limits by 6.99%. So, as I said, it won't be taken on the property tax share of the revenue limit, and it will be a 2.4% cut for the average district. So if you look at the add-on first, we'd first look at an add-on to a revenue limit of $275 in the elementary and $330 in the high school district, but then we're deficited by a factor of 0 .93001, which is the 6.99% deficit. And this is probably the best way to look at, at it as a graphic representation. There you can see the 0708 base revenue limit. Then you can see the 0809 if the COLA was in play and there was no deficit. And then in the third column, you can see actually the COLA and then the 6.99% deficit. And you can see it's a 2.4% cut for the average district over a current year base revenue limit funding. Governor's also proposing to change the COLA index. Right now it's based on what we call the state and local implicit, implicit price deflator. He wants to move it to the consumer price index for wage earners and clerical workers. Um, if you look at it retrospectively, basically the COLAs would have been pretty much the same over the last period of years, but in this year that new index would yield a lower COLA. And the idea is, is the governor wants to do that in the event that we have to, um, the governor has to pay for Prop 98 settle up funds, there'll be actually a lower amount that the state's obligated to pay. Revenue limit in hourly programs, also looking to be cut. Um, we're seeing 12% K-12 academic program, uh, grade 2-9 remedial program by 14%, grade 2-6 remedial program 28%. Mandated cost reimbursements are also underfunded again. The 38 mandates are still required because they're funding them at $1,000 per mandate in the budget proposal, which is kind of a trick that says, the Budget Act says that if, as long as you provide funding, you're still obligated to perform the mandate. So if they suspended the mandates altogether, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be obligated to perform them. So what they do is they just tinker around and put in the, a marginal amount of money where we're still obligated to do it. Um, 38,000 <laughs> 38, in budget as compared to an estimated 160 million in new claims projected in 0809. The budget does propose 150 million for 0708 and 0809 for deferred mandate claims. That was part of the deal that was entered into a couple of years ago. It's interesting that he is honoring that commitment to wipe out those backlog mandate amounts, but basically there's no new mandate money, which basically starts the practice again of deferring mandated cost reimbursements. And since there's the constitutional obligation to pay mandates, including the interest on it, it's just going to balloon out there again in the future. Special education also takes a big hit. Um, we're seeing it increase by the 4.94% COLA, but then cut by 10.9%. Proposed cut of 358 million exceeds the 169 million needed to fund the COLA. 
for a net cut of 189 million. Um, looking at about $30 per ADA or about 410,000 for the districts. Um, it's unclear how this cut will actually be implemented. We don't know if it'll be a deficit to the base funding, a negative COLA, or some other way. And since special education is already underfunded, this represents a huge cut to the under unrestricted side of the budget. Um, transportation, there was a number of one-time appropriations last year um, in these areas. Once again, the governor restores ongoing funding and then he cuts them at a 6.5% uh, below 078 levels. I had fun doing that. <laughs> <laughs> the categorical programs are expected to share the pain in 0809, no COLA, no growth, rollback in funding of approximately 6.5% from 0708 budget levels. Almost all categoricals on the state side will be affected. Um, we're seeing average reduction of 6.5% from 0708 funding levels. Before and after school programs taking a hit, um, basically, governor proposes reducing funding in 0809 by 59.6 million. Child development's taking a hit, 198.9 million in reductions proposed to Proposition 98 funded child care programs, no funding for COLA growth and reduction in program services. Um, governor estimates that approximately 8,000 child care slots will be lost from state school preschool programs, but cuts in other programs such as general child care and pre-kindergarten and family literacy program are expected. I actually ran out of that slide. I don't know what happened there. Child nutrition programs also took a hit. Um, it's interesting. We've been seeing increases in meal reimbursements. Actually, I think we saw like a 6% increase last year, and now we're seeing a 2% rollback. Long-term outlook, um, we know state's unemployment is rising. From the month of November, it was 5.6, up from 4.7% one year ago. Income growth is slowing. S interest rates actually went down today, but expected to go up later in the year. However, LAO and Department of Finance are still not projecting a recession in California. So what are the next steps? Watch the special session under Prop 58. Um, it'll set the tone for the 0809 budget debate. Look for the uh, legislative analyst's detailed analysis of proposed budget release in mid-February. It will contain recommendations to the legislature and include an updated state revenue forecast. And then look at the May, re the May revise, the May revision revenue forecast could change the landscape. And that's our crystal ball. <laughs> and so I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. So a lot to consume in a short period of time. Yes. On, on slide 11, one of the bullet points says that there uh, will be uh, cuts on the state share of revenue limits and no cut on property taxes. Yes. So I'm assuming that means that basic aid school districts will not suffer any consequences. We, I actually had this discussion with uh, Assistant Superintendent. Um, Turnbull, and you're absolutely right. Where this was problematic is that if you were a basic aid district that was on the cusp of going back into revenue limit, then it could be problematic. So what about the reverse? A revenue limit district on the cusp of falling over into basic aid? Well, let's think about that. A decrease in state aid could force you into basic aid status. That's correct. So if all the stars align and your AV increases and let's say you have declining enrollment, which you might not even need, let's say you have static enrollment, but you're taking a 2.4% cut in state aid over prior year, yeah, it could, it could catapult you into basic aid. But basic aid is predicated on, it's on your property tax, and of course part of this whole problem is because property taxes or property values are, are dropping, so a basic aid district that happens to be in an, in an area where property values are declining dramatically could get hit in that way. Yeah. But there are some, of course, that are not getting hit uh, with dropping property yeah, values. Yeah, that's only in properties that turn over. Unless you petition, I don't think that uh, you know you get across the board property tax relief. Well, there's a couple of things that, that happened, especially on the peninsula a few years ago, is that when you're talking about, when Silicon Valley, when you know the bubble burst, basically there was all these reassessments. So these districts that were, you know, 
basic aid forever, and basically we're seeing 11, 12, 15% AV growth per annum and ratcheted up their expenditure patterns to match that. Now they're increasing by, you know, 2% per year, which created all kinds of problems for them. So, but to answer your question, yeah, both of those scenarios could actually happen. So it, it's interesting that um, when you look at the deficit factor applied to the revenue limit, it looks so odd because you're saying, oh, it's 10.9% across everything, but it's only 6.99% on the revenue limit, and then you realize, oh, well, yeah, well, for most districts, it's X amount of property taxes, and how could they actually deficit that? They have no power to deficit, so. So obviously this is very general. We're getting the specifics for our district next week or when? Are Actually, we a couple of things will be happening. I think School Services of California is putting together another multi-year projection. And there's a couple of things that I left a voicemail uh, with John Gray about. And here are the things that I think that will change significantly from the first interim is one, you know, in, 9-10, we projected salary increases that were not negotiated. Well, we projected them based on the fact that there was going to be a positive COLA. So I think you project zero. That's a reasonable assumption when you're taking, you know, a big deficit going in there. We leave everything intact in, you know, going into 8-9, pursuant to whatever the collective bargaining agreements. But once you get into that second subsequent year, we'll probably look at things that, you know, we'll have an expectation that, you know, the caps enforced that, you know, we won't have that 2% salary increase. We'll probably want to refine our actual step and column. We're going to do everything we can do to m minimize and not worsen, you know, that second subsequent year within, you know, reasonable boundaries. So those, that's a conversation I still need to have with him. And then, you know, the, the big wild card for us still is what is really going to happen with enrollment. We're showing significant enrollment decline in the secondary district going in the next couple of years. I mean, you know, those are all variables that are dynamic, and I, I keep preaching that because the budget's a dynamic document. And, you know, we're really not in control of very many variables. You know, we can't control how many kids show up. We can't control what the state does to us. We can control some things on the expenditure side, but as you know, there's pressures there, too. So I think we'll get our first glimpse based on, you know, their multi-year which we'll probably use that as the springboard to do the second interim, and then we'll have to be doing a third interim, too. But we obviously will have to build the budget this spring based on what the governor has come out in January. Will, will we be able to make any um, changes in the inceptions before the May revise, or will school services stick to? They'll, st they'll stick to it through May revise is what will happen. And so... In the event there's not any indication that there's going to be a radical departure from the governor's, you know, proposals, then we'll still be dealing with these same assumptions through May revise. Uh, it is important to note that this is just the opening salvo, and it probably will be, you know, modified significantly, but unfortunately we're bound by the dartboard, which is the industry standard, and this is a huge discussion among the school business community right now because everybody's saying, oh, Prop 98 is never going to get suspended. There's not the votes. This is not going to happen. But then you have county offices and FICMAT and others who are saying, you know, in every other year in our whole history since revenue limits were invented, we've always abided by the dartboard. So why would we change now? Even though I think most of us have an inkling that something different is going to come out of this process. Until we know that, we've got to abide by what's probably a fairly conservative set of assumptions. Uh, listening to all this, I cannot help but wonder why we don't uh, uh, consider very seriously a, a freeze on all, all discretional spending until they get a better picture of where we are. And uh, I just wonder if we, if there'd be support on the board to ask the superintendent to come back with a, with an analysis of what can be frozen, 
and uh, and what the possibility, what the implications are of that. Uh, I already have it written down. Would you like my little post-it? <laughs> Don't need it. Well, I appreciate that, but I just, you know, it's sort of like, how can we hear this without saying that? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we're on to F2, Elementary District Program Improvement Status Report. Good. I've asked Robin to give us an update. Um, as you may know, I was supposed to be in Sacramento at hearings with the State Board of Education, what, a week and a half ago. Uh, those hearings were postponed, uh, so they won't happen until uh, another six weeks. Uh, the state frankly doesn't know what they're going to do with program improvement districts. I know that from the discussion from staffers in the department, uh, they have drawn a clear line between those districts that have uh, pervasive problems and didn't make AYP in, in every area or, or a lot of areas, and those districts like ours who missed AYP with one subgroup in one area, and that's all that was used to identify the district as program improvement. In our case, it was English learners in English language arts. So I've asked, uh, I've asked Robin to review what some of the discussion is, and uh, originally I wanted to go into likelihoods on this, uh, knowing that the, the Board of Education doesn't really know what to do yet, uh, and knowing that the governor wants to make a very clear case for, for intervening with those low-lying districts uh, that really haven't made AYP in a number of areas. Um, Robin, okay. tell us what you've Thank learned. Thank you. Well, I've kind of, you've said a lot of what I've learned is that the state doesn't really know. I'm in constant contact with the county office, and Carol Johansson there, the assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction, goes to the state once a month for her um, steering committee, the curriculum instruction steering committee. She's going on the 24th, so it's this week that she'll be going, and she said she may know more at that point. But as I said in the um, memo, she has heard that the next probable date for the, for the um, state board to make some kind of recommendation is in March. It started out, it was going to be in November, and then it was going to be in Jan uh, December, and then January. Um, I completed a um, kind of a, it was called a snapshot of the district, and answered several questions just describing who we are, um, what possible intervention might be the best suited for us given you know what we've done and how we've tried to uh, meet our AYP targets and um, Dr. Sarvis will have that if he's again asked to go and and to a hearing kind of situation and describe the district he'll use that as a reference um, on the as you see on the memo there's 98 California districts that are in this situation originally we went in to program improvement because our math students with special uh, with disabilities didn't make math targets for two years in a row once you're in you have to have every subgroup meet your AYP so at this point we've been not meeting it as Dr. Sarvis said in our with our English learners in English language arts by two percent and I don't know and on the back side in the different um, categories I don't know if that classifies I would think it is as one that barely missed it but I don't know all of the other districts. So, you know, that I don't believe we're in the first um, group of interventions where we would be recommended for further corrective action, have the date program, and it, w it could include replacing school district personnel, appointing a trustee, and, and on and on you can read. I think, um, you know, having a date might be an option, and in that case, our closest date provider would be the county office so that's a simple solution they're very you know they, we work with them all the time so if that were the intervention that would be one thing that would be easily done 
Um, we could have technical assistance, and I think at this point we would probably again go with the county office to work with us on that. Um, the revised and fully implemented LEA plan is a possibility because that falls into the number of districts that barely missed it. So if we're considered in that category, that would be something that, um, that we could do. We've already amended the LEA plan. That was something we had to do upon becoming a program improvement district. And then we've done several revisions since then, really addressing our English learners. So I was able to describe in that snapshot all the work we've been doing and you know all the initiatives that we put in place in a very intentional strategic manner not haphazard and you know trying one program after another just really setting a firm foundation on meeting the needs of English learners but you know as you can see and as you know well we haven't quite made our improvements that we need I know from looking at data that we have a lot of students that have come from the very, very bottom and moved up significantly, but we're not up to the bar yet. We had a lot of students down there. So we have been moving forward, but it's just not showing up in that kind of um, way. And it's not good enough. I mean, still 24% is still not what we want to aim for at our number of proficient English learners, certainly. We went way higher than that. So. Um, our hope is that we will be able to have an intervention that really helps us and supports us. And I know that's the intention of California Department of Ed and the State Board. They're really trying to figure out a match for districts. That's why they're taking all the time to do it. So another year rolls by and we'll see, you know, if they put something in place this spring. But I will let everyone know as we, you know, come forward. I know I, I gave you another memo in November that gave you an update. It was in the board brief. So we're just kind of regularly doing this. But we wanted to do this in a public fashion this time. Any questions? Yes. Um, it says that they're focusing, the state was focusing on 98 of California school districts that have not met the NCLB achievement targets for five consecutive years. But then at the top it says the Santa Barbara Elementary District was identified in March 2005. Presumably from the spring 2004 testing. That's correct. So it hasn't been five years. What happens is when you fall into program improvement, whether it's a site or a district, it means you haven't met your targets for two years. And then you would fall into year one. Mm -hmm. What happened in the program improvement districts, this was a first in 2005 when they identified program improvement districts, it was so late in the year in March, they gave you an additional year. So where it looks like now we've been in four years and it says five, we missed it for two years and we've actually got, we're in year three of program improvement as a district. Okay, so. Does that make sense? It, it, okay, so it sounds like we're in year three instead of year five. Uh, yes, for five years we haven't made our targets because you mm -hmm. have to miss two to even be identified and then you, when you're identified, it's year one. Oh, I see, so they're not talking about when your program improvement, they're just talking about the AYP targets. Well, and that, you, if you miss your AYP targets for two years in a row, boom, you become program improvement. Right, but in terms of the year five, it's about the targets and not Yes, that. exactly. Okay. So um, that's us. Um, that's us, yes. That's us and, um, is there any indication, I mean, they're, they're dealing with this so late in the year that um, by the time the next testing cycle ends, there will be a, a maybe double the amount of districts that are in year oh, five. Yes. <laughs> so is this going to be, then they're gonna say, no, it's only districts that are year six, or are they gonna stick with this year five? I don't think they know what they're going okay. to do. I mean, okay. <laughs> There, you're right. There could potentially be a lot more, a lot more districts that are in our situation. Um, you know, and this is the year when the target jumps another 10 percent. So we're not looking at 24.6. We're up at 35. So we've got a long way to go to get that. But with a significant increase, we could fall under safe harbor. We have another tool that well, I don't know if you call it a tool, but it's another piece of the STAR program where there's a new test called the CMA, which is in between the CAPA for our special needs students or our students with disabilities and the CSTs, there's an intermediary level where you can go up to 3% of your population can be with CAPA and CMA. So we'll have students in grades three, four, and five taking that for the first time. I don't know what that'll mean to our scores or, you know, have it be 
more appropriate for those students? I think it's a big question mark. <laughs> Dr. Noel, did well, I, you? I, uh, I always, when I see these talk, talk of interventions or uh, technical assistance, I always ask myself, what are they going to tell us that we are not already <laughs> telling ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's, that's true in many cases. So and you, the, you came from the county office. Right. <laughs> I mean, presumably you talk to those people all the time. Yes, I do, and I know exactly what they would do when they would come and give us technical yeah. assistance. And you're, and, and you're already doing it. Yes, we're doing some of it. What we might, what they may enforce with a date, if we were given or told we had to do that option, they would have to do more of a curriculum audit piece that we haven't done formally. It, it costs a lot of money for the county to do that. That was part of my responsibility at the county office. It's um, very comprehensive and um, you get a lot of data from it. But to tell you the truth, we know, you're right, it wouldn't necessarily be telling us anything we don't know. One piece on the last intervention with the um, fully implemented standards-based curriculum, next November we will be seeing the new English language arts adoptions available and uh, the board will, State Board of Education will be approving those that are, are adopting those that can be considered. Um, we're a little bit behind on our adoptions because we have to save money each year to do them. So we'll be doing the science and then next year we'll be doing math and then another year until English language arts. But that's an opportunity to then really fully implement in the sense that all of our teachers could receive training. There's still those training programs with the state and those are the pieces that I think were not fully implemented because not all of our teachers have had that training and it makes no sense to do it now with an old adoption and to run the training is really specific to the particular adoption like it would be open court um, there's a very little piece on just literacy so I'm hoping that's the kind of option we get and we can work start working toward that giving lots of professional development and then be really prepared for the new adoption but I again I don't know in looking at especially these um, bullets on the interventions um, it seems to be that there's some focus on trying to I guess modify if you will some of what might be seen as sanctions for the PI districts mm -hmm. and maybe um, not be so heavy-handed with the with the districts that have just barely missed and and be a little bit uh, maybe a, a little bit more there, have there be a little few more options in terms of how to deal with the with the increasing number of districts that are now mm -hmm. in PI status but I'm wondering if in your discussions if you've heard any discussions is there any talk about somehow mitigating what it would take to get out of PI status not, not, yeah, not specifically. I mean, there are examples of school districts and schools that have been able to exit. Mm -hmm. Isla Vista. Yes, Isla Vista, mm -hmm. exactly. And we saw La Cumbra this last year, you know, make great gains mm -hmm. um, with just really revamping a lot of things. So there, there are ways to do that. I think what, what they're looking at in districts that are just below the cutoff, they're probably looking to see have you made progress are you really flatlined or are you really making progress and if you look at our just flat data from the public view it looks like we're really flat but if you dig deeper and look at at each school and look at the kids who are really moving up you can see that we are making progress and so some of what we're working we're doing is really working mm -hmm. I don't know if they'll be able to take the time to do that kind of thing but if we get technical assistance if we're given that option that's the kind of thing that we would look at um, we you know we've got a lot in place just newly even this year with our teachers on special assignment and all of our English language development being implemented that's the kind of thing that takes a long time to really I mean not a long long time we should see some some kind of progress but it's not it's more foundational and professional development for the teachers it's not a quick fix, in other words. Uh, 
Okay, if you get technical assistance, is it, is it a freebie? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I really don't know what they'll put in place. When we first became program improvement, they had grants that funded it. I was going to say, the sanctions for becoming program right. improvement were they gave you money. Right, but those, are, of course, are gone. I mean, How much they, did we get? We got $150,000. One time only? One year it, only? Well, it went, spread over two years. Spread over two mm -hmm. years, okay. Mm -hmm. But that's, that, that's dried that's, up now. Oh, yes. We, okay. yeah. We use that for a lot of I mean, training schools, and such. Individual schools don't get any rewards no. for going on. No, they don't. Um, the The county office does get money from the state for the. Um, it used to be called S four. I'm trying. It's called RISTIS now. Regional support. Mm, I can't remember what it all stands for, but it's the structure that's put in place in the state to support program improvement districts and sites. They get a lot of money at the county level to support the schools and the districts for that. So a lot of the technical assistance is, we're getting some right now, is free. Thank you. I'm not sure we should call them rewards, though. <laughs> it really is assistance. And, well, it's, and it, and it I'm seems speaking, entitled. I'm just speaking technically. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, we can move on to um, F3, which is the report on this recent single plan for student achievement presentations that we have for the public. We have in uh, December, around December, uh, four meetings um, from each of the, which have the principals present their uh, plans, um, usually in, yeah, I guess December and January. And they focus on the categorical programs. And uh, I think there's been some talk that that sort of ties our hands in what we can talk about. And so I, we have some choices because we don't actually have to do these uh, plans. We could do it differently. We can continue the way we are. We could um, refocus them and have, I guess, have. Uh, principals talk about a variety of things besides just categoricals. I want to propose as another uh, something to consider is that we have about 24 meetings, regular meetings, not our special meetings, but about 24 meetings a year, which is about one school, one site per meeting. We could have a principals come and give presentations. It, it might make our meetings a little longer, but we could try it, see how it works, is have them come and make a presentation, maybe on a something something that's going on in their school that they want to present. No, don't like that idea. I can hear this that now. That would be just public relations. But, but it would give us a chance. I w would like at some point, I don't want to let this go completely because I think there needs to be some interaction between the board and principals on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, but I'm not sure how to do that, or uh, I'll, I'll just open it up. Yes, Ms. Cordero. Well, I was just going to say, I, I really like the idea of inviting schools to present at the board meetings on something that's going on in their, in their schools, and I, I really love the idea that, we, that every meeting would be focused on, that there would be at least some of our attention focused on a particular school in, in a more, um, I don't necessarily want to say positive, although I, I would certainly hope that it would be positive, um, but in a, in a sort of a more um, specific way where we're looking at that school. However, I don't see that being the single site plan. Um, I, so I, I see that being something totally different um, and the site plans I think we there needs to be m we need to maintain some of the accountability aspect that are is included there um, and I think it needs to be more comprehensive than what we could probably manage in a board meeting um, so I like your idea but I see it as a totally separate a pr uh, concept. Um, well, I, I actually think that we do have the opportunity to, do, to accomplish what you're talking about, and it's under introductions, proclamations, presentations, or recognitions. And, you know, if you, not you personally, if staff kept track of what schools, you know, did presentations or, you know, what 
then they could see that the opportunity was meted out in an even-handed way, so that we would be seeing a good a portion of our elementary students doing, you know, singing whatever the presentation is, uh, you know, of our junior high and high school students. I just think it's a matter of making a more concerted effort because we do already allocate time for those kinds of activities as it is. Um, I happen, I like the, I like getting together with principals. I think it's, um, it's a great dialogue that often takes place, but it's also stultifying. It's uh, very pressure filled for them. Um, I don't think that we're, you know, necessarily getting, uh, I mean, you know, we can review the single plans and vote up or down or ask questions without ever having the principles there. It's, it's really to review categorical budgets. Um, so I'm not sure that we need to go through this process of trying to schedule, um, you know, a lot of very long meetings. Um, and I, you know, it would be nice to come up with some other solution but I don't see the need for the single plan presentations the way they stand now. Do you Can you elaborate? Is there something else that we would do then in some other interaction that we could have with principals? Sure, visit their school site. Well, I, I, I would like to wait in here. Uh, it seems to me that, that it's, it's one of the few times that that the uh, board and the public get to talk to principals, uh, and uh, and I view it mostly in in accountability terms. I'd, I'd hate to see us abandon accountability and go for uh, charming presentations of what's going on on campuses only. I think we need both. Uh, I I find that the presentations as they are now done uh, are tedious. Uh, among the tedious parts is that you, if if you do your homework and read it all, then then basically you're going to come in and listen to them read it back to you. You don't need you know you don't need both an oral presentation uh, of uh, you know and the written presentation, but but the opportunity to question principles uh, to me is is very important and and it and it's important because it informs me as a board member, but I think it's also important because it informs the community. Uh, they are public meetings and it gets the public's business in before the public. Um, we obviously, we have to approve the single plans um, and, um, but again, I have a problem with the current format. My frustration with it is as Dr. Noel said, generally it's just a reading back of what you've already read. Um, I would prefer to see a situation where we're, we're here as we have questions about them. Maybe if we're approving a set, uh, you know, we could do half of the elementaries and half those elementary principals could be here in the audience as it's presented to us by the assistant superintendents. And then they're here for our questions. So as we have questions about the single plans, we can call principals up to the podium. I mean, my fr frustration with it is that we bring up specific things, um, but we never, we never turn down any single plan. We never, uh, I've never seen this board uh, disapprove a single plan. And so it feels like this sort of, you know, it is an opp opportunity to question back and forth in public, although hopefully we are talking to these principals as we visit their sites. Um, but I, I really feel like it, it it almost serves no ultimate purpose because we have no teeth, really, and it's it's up to what's going on with staff between principals and uh, the district office to make sure that the site councils are working cohesively, that it's a it's a um, a live document that's being changed over time, and not just something that principals can say, "Phew, got through that presentation. We didn't like these parts of it, but it's done." Um, I have to say, I would really like to hear what the superintendent's vision would be. Um, in terms of how do you think would be the most effective use of principal's time and the board's time when it comes to single plans? May I, may I just add a, a f kind of a footnote to what you said, though? Uh, I think there is a useful purpose that we're not thinking about, and that is the conversation that happens on the campuses among the teachers and the uh, administrators on the campuses to get ready for the plan. 
in my, at least in, I know in some campuses, it's a big effort. And, and I think that's a functional uh, aspect of it that uh, we, don't, we don't see. We just see the, the, the show. But, uh, but something went into it, and I think that's important. We don't. And, and site councils should be working constantly on their single plans. But, but there would always be a deadline. I mean, they have to. It has to be reviewed by us annually. So that process would always be going on. Um, but uh, I guess that process would go on no matter what, Dr. Noel. What you're really talking about is some assurance that the process did take place by having a public presentation coupled with I, it. I, I related to uh, my view of what, what exams, as a teacher, what the exams were for me. They gave me information, but the most important thing they did was what the students were doing anticipating the exam. Ms. Cordero. The, the work that oh. goes into the preparation was intrinsically valuable. Uh, and I believe that's true about the single plans. Yes, I, for me, the, the single plans serve two purposes. It, well, I should say the single plan presentations serve two purposes. Um, one, they give us a chance to review the single plans and to ask questions of the principals uh, um, regarding those plans. And two, they give us a chance to interact with the principals. And I see both of those as being important. The one purpose I think we could achieve by simply having, as we said, we all, we read the board, we read the plans, and then we listen to the principals tell us what's in the plans. Um, I think we could achieve, basically achieve that goal by simply getting, have, reading the plans, getting together, identifying the questions that we have, forwarding those questions to the principals, and letting the principals respond to them so that we get, we get it back. I think, I actually think it would probably make our questions more meaningful um, if we did put them into writing and gave them to the principals and allowed the principals to respond to them with some time to think about it and uh, look at additional data if they need, um, talk to other people on the campus, et cetera, rather than putting them on the spot right then and there for an extemporaneous answer. Um, but the other component, which is getting to interact with the principals, and I think that's important because we can do that individually by visiting the campuses, but I sometimes think it's important to hear the concerns, and maybe we could do that just in our discussions around the questions, what the other board members are asking or addressing, et cetera. Um, so I think we could maybe do that process with, with you know, just a, a, in a much more streamlined way if we, if we put our questions in writing first, and then perhaps the principal could simply present to us rather than the full single site plan, present back to us on what the questions that we had. Well, I mean, this is a conference item. Um, so I guess what I'd, I'd like to suggest is, you know, rather, rather than trying to sift through options right now, what if we bring back information from the two superintendents after a principal's council and see if those great minds can come up with um, other ideas or options as well that can then be brought back and and uh, you know add to the discussion. Um, I mean, there's no cons it doesn't seem like there's any real consensus here right now. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there would be some ideas that we might be able to organize ourselves around. May I jump in on the discussion? Um, in in fact, I'd like to differentiate between a, a review of school programs and conversation with the principal versus a uh, review specifically of the single plan for student achievement, uh, which is categorical programs at the school. And I'd like you to consider, first of all, that a lot of the board questions in this last round, we, we spent a good chunk of time on four days um, going through a parade of, of principals and, and looking at their plans. But a lot of those questions were not about categorical programs. They were about other things going on at the school, about the gate program. They weren't specifically the, the LEA-based programs. 
So I, I would ask you to consider that first. Uh, secondly, uh, if I was asked to devise a system of working with the principal uh, that I thought was most effective in ensuring that those single plans for student achievement uh, had efficacy, uh, were devoid of the BS factor, <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that the things we were hearing were really things that were going to make a difference, I wouldn't do that in public. I wouldn't even do it in front of you. I would sit down with each principal. I would sit down with the principal, with the assistant superintendent. I would have probably just two other cabinet members, probably the uh, director of compliance and categorical programs and the director of research and technology. And we would have a, you know, at times very intimate discussion about those goals, about meeting those goals, problems in meeting those goals, and whether we think the plan actually addresses the, the effectiveness of the program and, and would even reasonably be expected to accomplish the new goals. Now, that's, that's another separate discussion that I would, uh, that I would propose. Uh, there are a number of ways to go about this, and I know that the board doesn't have a lot of opportunities to have those kinds of discussions with the principal. Um, I think it is worthwhile for the principal and the staff to spend time preparing so that they really keep focused. In fact, it's one of those things that I think really keeps the staff, uh, and especially the, the leader at the school, focused on what the salient goals and objectives are. And I don't think it's just uh, categorical programs. I mean, I think it's even broader than that. In fact, I, I, I like using our uh, focus goal sheets uh, that Davis Hayden prepares. You know, those aren't out of the single plan, uh, but they focus, uh, again, uh, in a very summary way on the goals that the board has targeted as board focus goals and they ask the school to address those goals in any number of ways and I would rather have a discussion with the principal in public uh, and with the board about those goals that are board focus goals and the uh, most important or the most critical educational programs at the school. Uh, and I know we always run the risk of having someone just give us a litany of the 25 great things happening at the school. We've seen that in the past, and we actively campaign against it, <laughs> and, and we still get plenty of that. But uh, I, I do think that if a person was asked, for example, to focus on the three most critical programs or changes you know, it might be in terms of, uh, of staff involvement in, in decision making. It might be uh, a very specific program, but what are the most critical initiatives at your school? Then I think you'll get a better discussion about what's happening at the school. And you could ask other questions about the school, but just to re use this as a way to review the single plan, I don't think is in a very effective way to ensure that the single plan is um, meets the budget requirements, is, is going to accomplish what it should accomplish. I don't mean that the board members shouldn't uh, be given a look at those single plans. Uh, you know, in Los Angeles Unified, uh, those don't get read by, by board members. And in most districts, there's no presentation in front of the board uh, because in most districts they're, well, I, w I won't say most districts, you know, most districts are actually around 1,400 kids, I think is the median. Uh, but there are a lot of districts, there are a good um, you know, 100 districts that are 20,000 and above, and, and once you have 35 uh, schools in a district or more, uh, you're not able to run through a process like that with a board in, in any sort of a meaningful way. I, whatever, whatever way it goes, I, I, I think I, uh, Mrs. Cordero put her finger on one aspect of it. Part of that dialogue, I mean, there's the serendipity involved in it. You aren't mm -hmm. sure, but you know, Mrs. Cordero will ask a question, that'll 
make you think of something else that you wish you were to ask. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the other aspect is, but uh, but it can't just be free floating. There, ha there ha it seems to me it has to be tied to some documentation, because if you look at what we do in there, and you're right, we don't just ask about categorical stuff. We're we're saying, what happened to these test scores? You know, or oh, aren't those wonderful? Mm -hmm. or, uh, and and that that's not a categorical question. That's a broader thing. So we need some kind of a base for the for the dialogue. Well, I like the suggestion that you do go through the written plans and you have the opportunity to ask specific questions about the written, about the written plans. Yeah. Well, I thought somebody was suggesting really that it's it's a broader dialogue than just categoricals. Well, and and, I was. and we don't and we don't have a a written document about the rest of the uh, of the of the scene, the the big part. Right. And and, uh, and that conversation would be nice if we could expand it. Yeah, we, we do that anyway in the single plan. That's our only venue where we get to. Well, we have expanded it to some extent in that when we look at the overall goals of the school and we look at the goal sheets that Davis Hayden has prepared and, and look at that data, uh, that is not just single plan data. Yeah. I mean, it's really board focus goal data. I, I wanted to clarify, I think, um, Dr. Sharvis, I was wondering in your in your comments, were were you suggesting or, or offering as a possibility that you and the superintendent and perhaps our director of compliance and whomever else would be appropriate would meet with the principals and review the plans rather than going through the process that we normally do with the board? That was kind of, that was your suggesting yes. I'm suggesting that as a way to ensure that those single plans are going to be most effective. I think it would be most effective to sit down in the conference room with the principal and having that discussion well, without anyone else even listening in. Yes. As you were saying that, with I, that's what I understood, and I wanted to just clarify that that was correct. I was wondering if there might be a a kind of a hybrid. Where, because one of the con one of the concerns that we have is that they the presentations do become a bit tedious because it's pretty much just a repetition of what we see in the plan, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm wondering if we could do some sort of a hybrid with uh, the principals meeting with you and also meeting with us. And I was thinking, although this is just off the top of my head tonight, I mean, there might be other ways to look at it. If we divided it up so that the board didn't see, uh, didn't meet with every principal every year, but rather maybe staggered them so that they met with you every year. Somebody reviewed those every year and we would even get copies of them so that we would, re we would see them every year, but not necessarily meet with every principal every year um, so that when the principal, w when, when, when we had a chance, when it was our rotation to meet with that particular school, there would perhaps be a little bit more substance to it, um, a little bit more meaning to it. And I'm throwing that out as an idea. I'm not even entirely certain that I, I, I don't even know how I feel about that exactly, but it just sort of <laughs> popped up as an idea of a way of, of kind of meshing these two uh, practices together. Yeah. Ms. Parker. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of smiling at them because it kind of reminds me of a, the CPM visit, you know, your time's <laughs> up, <laughs> it's you this year. Um, my issue with that is that we, we do have to approve all the single plans. I mean, we have to look at them all and we have to approve them as a board, we're required to do that. Um, so if we have questions about, we may have questions about a, a, a particular school's single plan then they're not on the rotation that year, whatever. I mean, I want to be sure that, that, you know, we keep in mind that things could be, it, it, it could be, you know, quite different from uh, what some pre-assigned list would be. Right, and I imagine that we would have to f flesh that out, but I was thinking we would go through that process of, responding in writing to all the schools, but the actual presentations, you know, that wouldn't necessarily happen every year. I mean, but certainly we would review the plans every year and respond to the 
to the principals, et cetera, and maybe ask them to respond to us, but in, in a much more streamlined fashion. I have a question. Maybe it's uh, for, for Mr. Smith as well. Uh, so we have the single plan that says I'm going to spend on going to spend our categorical money this way, this way, this way, this way. And then Mr. Smith is telling us that at the end of the year there's all this unspent money. How do we put that together? So single plan, something's not doing its, its job there. I'm not sure that's on top. Well, the other assistant superintendents could address that as well. Uh, that's the kind of discussion that we're having with sites on a regular basis, that whether they're providing services and actually spending that money. In the past, we have had some schools that bank that money. Uh, uh, After coming to us with a single plan saying, we're, here's how we want to spend the money, they didn't spend it the way they said, they banked it. You, this, this doesn't work well. Well, uh, Paul, yeah, I, there are, I, I had actually written down <laughs> <laughs> to the to my own peril because I know the principals are all watching on Saturday night. Uh, I had actually written down a question along the lines of how can we have a school version of interim budgets, and how can we possibly have you approve an initial budget and then we simply check in three times a year most specifically at the end of the year, you know, the, the, the mid-year, it wouldn't even have to be the interim budgets necessarily, but um, if there was sort of a end of first semester spending report, literally a, like a bar graph, and actually School Plan Online provides you with that kind of thing, and, and so the, the school site would say, here's where we are, and we could fact check just across the, the way here with the, the, the fiscal department. And then at the end of the year, most importantly, through the, the site councils having adopted their their version of a preliminary preliminary budget for the following fall, you would see next year's budget in the spring. You would see then immediately upon um, say first quarter in the in the fall how they're actually spending. Then again throughout the year, just checking, 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 and it would be it could be a consent item. It could be something very simple. You know, obviously capacity is an issue and, and we don't want to overburden already overburdened staff, but that was the question I had asked and well, Eric's a better person well, to answer. Well, when we pull out a copy of what that report looks like out of the single plan, uh, because sure. obviously an answer, a good answer to this question is interim reports, which is what you're doing in budget checks right now. Well, See, I, this I kind of, had, oh. I just, I'll, 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 I'll finish this point thought. And, uh, as you know, I, I've been concerned from time to time that, that the categorical money doesn't get spent appropriately, and, uh, and, and apparently some of it doesn't get spent at all. Uh, and and uh, there's just, we need a method to, to monitor that and make sure that they're spending exactly the way we've approved it uh, and spending it because if they don't need, if they don't spend it, that means they didn't need it or some service wasn't delivered or, I mean, we, that, that, that needs to be a tight system, not, a, not something that ends up with big surpluses. Or, mm -hmm. well, I, well, I think this brings us back to what Ms. Harder mentioned earlier, and that is to get feedback from the principals, as well as what we've heard tonight from all of us, um, and to maybe come back with some ideas of possible ways we could deal with this because clearly we, as Ms. Harder said earlier, we're not going to reach consensus tonight, but I think we've brainstormed a lot of interesting ideas so far, and I'm sure you'd get even more in talking to the principals. And, and also, I, I guess I was about to say, while I think the discussion we're having is necessary, I think it's getting a little bit further afield than discussing how to proceed with future uh, single plan presentations. And so I don't know if you want to con uh, you know, have a different kind of agenda item the next time to include that sort of uh, budget discussion um, and check in over School the course of the year. Right. In general. Right. Good. Okay. Uh, we're going back uh, to G to the um, consent agenda. I took off D15, which was the Peabody Charter School, and I had a just a couple questions here. Um, it says in the second. Or 
it reminds uh, uh, in the second paragraph of the little report here on not on the cover sheet but the second page uh, that there through the that the from the exploration center that three hundred thousand is still owed to the district and then it proceeds to talk about that they are raising money for kitchen and so forth and I'm just asking Mr. Hetyank, um whether our 300,000 isn't ahead of their kitchen. <laughs> I'm sorry, with the 300,000 was? That they owe us. They, they still owe approximately $300,000, yes. So they aren't, it, it makes it sound like they are um, collecting money or raising money for some changes to their kitchen. There, Is that there was a kitchen project that was designed, went to DSA, and when it came time to do the project last summer, Peabody informed us that they didn't wish to proceed. So we're pulling out the portion of that project that is ADA renovation and doing that this coming summer, and we have invoiced Peabody for their share of the design costs for the project that they chose not to proceed with, but we've not yet received that money. It's more money. So any, th <laughs> any kitchen project beyond that, I'm not aware of. Okay. These are really questions for Ms. Ford. I mean, I, it might be more appropriate to funnel these questions through Ms. Swaski to Ms. Ford. And I actually had a conversation with um, Kate Ford about this because I had heard that they were raising money for the cafeteria. And her uh, answer to that was that it was actually two separate kind of uh, attacks, you know, if you will. That she was very aware of the $300,000 that they still owed and that was one group of people fund you know fundraising for that and this was a separate thing that they wanted to get started for their kitchen I can get more information for you though well it just you know they, they're holding uh, yes. f over 400,000 in undesignated reserves beyond their 300 uh, beyond their 3 percent I'm sure with the state of the budget that it will com get completely eaten up but it is, I, maybe Mr. Hetyank, you can a answer when they plan on paying back the 300000 <laughs> I've not been given a date. Well, I do know that, uh, that, that it was just recently that we, that, uh, we received half of the 600000 that they owed within the last, I believe, two months. Uh, we received $300,000 to take the amount they owed us down by half. Well, I'll, I'll be blunt and undiplomatic. I'd be fine if Ms. Swaski carried forward the message that at least this board member feels as though they should honor the obligation on the Exploration Center before they embark on other capital fundraising projects. I'd be happy to do that. Thank and you for saying that so well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can give you a report in the board brief, or how would you like to get that back? Board brief is fine. Well, okay, thank you. There's also on here uh, one more little question. Um, it just says, uh, we, since we have never uh, have any opportunity to ask this, uh, it says that Peabody formed their own certificated and classified bargaining units. Um, curious if anyone knows what what uh, union, what uh, how that's operating? They're working with CTA. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Do uh, I hear? May, may I just add that a couple of months ago, uh, I emailed Kate that the board expects to have that money paid back and cannot wait a number of years because we're down to the end of the I-98 money and we need that money for projects. And kitchens and, yes. <laughs> yes. and other schools. Move to approve item D15. D15. Second. Parker. Harder. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Five zero. Uh, and we go back to coming events. And do you have any coming events we haven't heard about? No. No. Any board correspondence? No. Then I get to wait. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The Did we, I miss we one? skipped oh, I board comments. And I just have two quick comments. Sorry, one, I just wanted to uh, mention the Martin Luther King day activities that took place at the Marjorie Luke, well, started at Santa Barbara High School, marched to the Marjorie Luke Theater, and during the course of that, of the festivities that took place, several students, both from our district and not from our district, um, but several of our district students were honored for, as winners in the poetry and 
essay contest. And if you, um, if you have any doubts about the future generations, they would be assuaged by uh, listening to those magnificent uh, writings that the students did. I, I'm happy to say they all received standing ovations for their, for their endeavors, and they were outstanding. Um, then just one quick question in our, we had in recently in our board brief the dropout data, and I was, I noticed that we didn't have any dropout data for African American students, and I know our African American population is relatively small, but I was just wondering if we could maybe get that information. Let me find out. Okay. Good. Thank you. Excuse me, I didn't see this back page here. Any other board comments? <laughs> um, any future agenda items? No? We do have a, another board meeting. Next week. Regular board meeting next week. Next week. Don't forget. See you then. <laughs>